All right, what's going on, family? What's going on? Adjust this. Uh, this is a good phone stand right there. Cool. All right, so I'm going to give it a second for people to tune in. Um, Do Dirt, you've been tagged in here. Um, Andrew Hooper, you've been tagged in here. Robert Anderson, you've been tagged in here. Okay. So I know it's, it's uh, 10 p.m. It's late. A lot of us got to go um, and grind tomorrow morning. So this is not intended to be a lengthy session. Um, this is just a preliminary discussion um, to kind of fill things out, see what the grievances are, um, and go from there. So uh, let's see. Okay, hold on real quick. I'm going to give him a second to join in. Um, shalom to Yolanda Donald in the building. Shalom to Sean Henderson. So I want to do this real quick before I settle down and get ready for bed. Um, my household's a little busy, so forgive me for any noise that you're hearing in the background. Um, but I'm waiting for Do Dirt to show up. Um, let's see if he shows up here. Let's see. So I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him a moment. Peace and shalom to you as well, Yehuda. Um, all right, I'm waiting. Somebody tag him up in here, man. Somebody tag him. His name is Do D E W Dirt. Oh, there he go. All right, let's bring him on. All right, let's see what's going on here. All right, what's going on, man? Hey, Shalom. What's going on? Shalom, Shalom. Oh, you said Shalom. Oh, okay. I was gonna say grace and peace unto you, my brother. But it's all good. How you doing? I'm great. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Doing well. No complaints. No complaints. Mm -hmm. Are you? Are you? Uh, do you have a few minutes to chat? I couldn't hear you. Broke up a little bit. Oh, it's all good. Do you have a few minutes to chat? Oh yeah, I got a few minutes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so I want to first, um, you know, just extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining in. Um, you know, I don't know you personally, and I don't know if you know about me personally. Um, but uh, because there seems to be a dichotomy and juxtaposition in regards to our worldviews, um, as we conveyed on a thread uh, of a mutual acquaintance, um, I wanted to see what your grievances are, so that way um, I can adjudicate over them, because I don't know if these are personal grievances that you have, or if this is a worldview clashing uh, grievance, or if this is maybe um, some kind of cr crusade uh, grievance that you may have, but I would like to hear it. I would like for the audience to hear it as well. And I know um, Andrew Hooper and me are supposed to have a discussion coming up soon, um, but I don't think that he and um, Robert is available right now. So I know you're like third in charge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, <laughs> so well, that um, being, uh -huh. well, that well, that being said, I am Andrew Hooper. What? Oh yeah. You are? Right. Oh, yeah. Andrew, why are you using a different name? What's up with this dude, Dirt uh, alias? What's listen, going listen, on? Listen. No, I ain't, listen, I ain't putting that out there because uh, there's people out in the wilderness. They want to know, and I ain't going to tell them why. But, <laughs> you know what okay. I'm saying? <laughs> that, that way, I, I can move around, and they don't got the Oh, you're breaking up? This, I don't know. This Facebook, this thing, thing steady. Yeah, I see your face now. Okay. Oh, you... You are Andrew Hooper, okay. Oh, That's yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, cool, cool, so, cool. All right. So go ahead. I'll give you the floor. Give me a few minutes. Go ahead. All right, cool. So the thing with uh, Kelly Richardson, it's never a personal thing. It's always going to be a doctrinal thing. Mm -hmm. So then he had this bus. 
and they were making comments about the Bible, saying different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're giving correction through the scripture. Some people get a little emotional when they get corrected, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, at that point, whatever the case be, when I come in, I mean, I know how Pastor Robert Anderson is. He's not going to sit up there and argue with an emotional woman. Mm -hmm. What we have occurred is that a lot of times Hebrew Israelites or so-called Hebrew Israelites want to come in, be disrespectful, say a bunch of different things, and then run until they tell when the scripture corrects them. So mm -hmm. that being said, first of all, I'm going to tell you this. The brother lied. Nobody cussed those women out. He just simply said, always here. The so-called Hebrew Israelites telling the women in the chat to do. Go get your husband. So don't key a term and then get mad when it's used against you. Because if that's, the, if that's your system of things that a woman has to go get her husband, then these women shouldn't be on there doing that. And I don't know if they all believe that, but error is error. And what we do, we go against error. So mm -hmm. now when he was on Brother Berean's show, he wanted to say, oh, they were trying to promote their platform and this and that. That was a lie. The thing was this, if he had a disagreement with us, it was simply put up, here's where you can, here is where you can address us mm -hmm. and deal with whatever the topics are. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, I have a problem because the doctrine does not promote that you should go around teaching you a Hebrew. The gospel mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ teaches the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. Paul also says in Philippians 3 that all those things, all of those titles are nothing but dumb, but that you what? Promote Christ. We never see any of those people going around promoting or adding to the word of God. You should teach your nationality. You should teach your genealogy. Doctrine says don't add. That's Revelation chapter 22, 18. Proverbs 30 and 6. Deuteronomy 4 and 2. All of those adding something that is not an example of the Bible, you are in error. Flat. Mm -hmm. It's not for me to change. It's not for them to change. Here's mm -hmm. the thing. If you come in with something new, then it ain't true. We already have all the examples in the Bible of what should be taught. Period. What does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say? 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God for correction, reproof, right? God called everybody in the Bible who became believers in Christ. The example is that they are called Christians, period. Anything outside of that, you and error because the Bible doesn't agree with you. That's flat. Mm -hmm. That's doctrine. Mm -hmm. So now, man can come up with what is uh, Matthew 6. You have the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Satan, and the doctrine of God, if you're coming up with another doctrine, we are charged to come against you. Mm -hmm. Now, if anybody don't like it, they can take it up with God. But our job mm -hmm. is to occupy until he comes. And that's what we're going to do. So, cool. we did not go on Kelly Richardson's show because any man that sits and tells a bald face lie when you can go back and see the thread and see that nobody was cussing and saying disrespectful things, that's on him. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have to address it, never, nor did I ever tell him that I would come in there and address him. Now, I told you I would address you, so I came mm -hmm. and addressed you. See what Correct. I'm saying? Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. Okay, okay. that's what's up. So, I mean, um, I appreciate you laying down your premise um, mm -hmm. so that way we have it on the record. Um, you guys yeah. have a YouTube channel um, that I just recently checked out. It's interesting because I think somebody shared it with me like a year ago. And I've mm -hmm. seen a couple of videos of y'all, and um, you also got a book that's out, too. Can you speak a little bit on the book? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, we have the book, The Black Hebrew Israelite. No, Hebrew Israelites, formerly known as The Black Hebrew Israelite. And it's named that way because, first of all, the black or so-called black Hebrew Israelites come out. These are the terms that they use and say, we're the black Hebrew Israelites. The black mm -hmm. Hebrew Israelites. When they see the error in it, then they say, oh, no, well, we're going to change our ways. Well, this is the thing. God never charged you to come out and do that in the first place. 
So, terms that they came out using, trying to attack the church, use it against them, and then you get upset because you start to find out you don't see Hebrew Israelite in the Bible. There was Israel. Israelite. We are the black. Hebrew Israelites. It tells you don't teach genealogy or nationality. Titus 3 and 9, 1 Timothy 1 and 4. It tells you all these things are useless. But when you come and you try to teach them and then we come against you and you just don't want to receive the word of God, that is the doctrine of there ain't nothing else to be said. You're wrong. You're incorrect. Mm -hmm. So Okay. So that's the, that's the summation of the, the actual book, right? Yeah, it gives you yeah all the information of gotcha. what is taught, and then it gives you the information of the correct context in which the scripture is taught. Gotcha, That's gotcha. Right. So as you can see here on the mm -hmm. screen, I have the book, all right? right. Um, and um, you know, I'm not going to scroll through all of it, obviously, but I just want people to see it's it's pretty lengthy in regards to the various topics that it covers, um, and. You know, there's several things in here that it talks about. So I've been reviewing it, um, mm -hmm. just peer review it, just to kind of see what the angle is that you guys are coming from before I have a formal dialogue to make sure I'm not creating a straw man, right? I'm not going to assume how the denomination y'all are. I don't know what your tenets of faith are. I don't know any of that, right? So your book does not really focus on that because this is purely an apologetic work. Um, dealing with the Hebrew Israelite community and the beliefs of the quote unquote black Hebrew Israelites. So, if you don't mind, for the people watching, uh, can you just tell us what is your denominational background and some of your general tenets of faith that you believe is orthodox that Israelites come against? Okay. Now, denomination, I'm non denominational. I'm just a believer in Christ. Faith alone, Christ alone. That's mm -hmm. it. No Are simpler than that. The word of God, flat. Nothing to add to it. Nothing subtracted from it. Now, mm -hmm. the problem that I have with the so-called Hebrew Israelites is they try to put people back up under legalism. Telling you mm -hmm. that you have to go back under the, the law of Moses. That you have to keep the Sabbath day. That you can't eat certain things. Now, that's mm -hmm. not what the Bible promotes anymore. Matter of fact, okay. if we look at it, Genesis 9-3, when it starts off, it doesn't start off talking to Israelites, and it tells you that everything God created, every creeping thing shall be made food for you. So who is that talking to? That's talking to the world, anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. Like I said, with this whole legalism thing and trying to put people under doctrines that nobody could have held to in the first place, and the Bible tells you that, mm -hmm. is wrong. That which was sealed in the old that Israel did not understand is revealed in the new. Mm -hmm. So that being said, if you try to dive back into the old and stick to what we call historical revisionism and put mm -hmm. yourself back in the Old Testament as if that was directly talking to you after the mm -hmm. Messiah came, then guess what? You're in error. Mm -hmm. Because we see that no such thing was given to the church. We see that in Acts chapter 15. When the new believers came in, none of those stipulations was put on in them. And then it's a constant attack to try to say that, oh, Christians aren't law keepers. Christians don't have no commandments. Well, I'll give you a commandment that covers everything. First Thessalonians 5.22 it says, abstain from all forms of evil. That be bottom line. That's just one line. And it says, abstain from all forms of evil. Mm -hmm. So then... When you come out as a fairly new group and try to attack the Christian church and then get mad because we do know how to defend and just because you ran up against some people who don't know how to defend has absolutely nothing to do with me giving you correction and giving it to you sternly. That's mm -hmm. how Christ did it. That's how Paul did it. That's how he did mm -hmm. it with Peter. And that's, mm -hmm. how we call, that's how we charge to do it. Now, am I going to come calling you a bunch of coons and different nonsense that we see from the black so-called Hebrew Israelite community? Definitely mm -hmm. not. I'm not going to do that because God tells me not to. But when I tell you that you're in error and that you're incorrect, the bottom line is this. I can go to the scriptures and I can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's what gotcha. I am. I'm a Bible guy. 
Gotcha. Now, there's a lot of people who say that they are Bible guys, right? And there's a lot of different doctrines out there in Christianity as well, right? So there are certain things that people will ask you to try and ascertain what your angle is, because some of them to some people um, is a matter of soteriology or how you look at your salvation. Um, do you believe that baptism is necessary for salvation? Do what I believe baptism? that bat what what baptism? Is baptism, let me see, is it necessary for salvation? What a here's baptism. The, here's the, here's, the, here's mm -hmm. the bottom line. Can you not receive baptism and be saved? Yes. But it is a sin if you know that you are to be baptized and don't. Because the thief on the cross was saved. Yet he didn't get off that cross. He didn't see no water. But he was in heaven that day. So that's the bottom line. If God tells you to be baptized in water, then you should be baptized in water. That's mm -hmm. a commandment. Go and be baptized. But if you happen to get saved today and I preach to you the gospel and you run across the street and get your savior, then guess what? You saved, whether mm -hmm. you see water or not. Gotcha. Okay. That's so, Bible. So when, when uh, Paul talks in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that whatsoever mm -hmm. things were written aforetime time were written for our learners so that we through the patient and comfort of scriptures might have hope. Uh, what is he referring to? Uh, um, uh, read it again. I'm sorry. I don't have my Bible with me. So No, it's okay. I'm doing this off the dome. I'm saying uh, Romans 15 and 4. Uh, Paul uh -huh. says, whatsoever things were written aforetime time were written for our learning so that we through the patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, when he says whatsoever things were written aforetime, time, that means in the past, that we might mm -hmm. have hope via the scriptures. What is he referencing mm -hmm. in that um, statement? I'm sure he's left, uh, referencing the law and the prophets, those things that were written to them for their learning. Cool. So mm -hmm. then he was speaking to who? The, the, the people he's at... speaking to the Rome? Romans. Okay, yeah. so he was telling them that um, even if you're a Gentile um, and if you're a Jew, that you can still get learning uh, through the Old Testament, right? The Tanakh. Um, because now, in reading these scriptures, you can have comfort and hope. Is that what he's referencing? Now, it possibly could be. This is the thing. If you go and mm -hmm. read the Old Testament today, you can get mm -hmm. learning. But does that put you under the law of Moses? Absolutely not. So you gotcha. can learn from their mistakes. You can learn from the things that they did. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't put you under the stipulation to go back up under the law of Moses. Gotcha. It just doesn't. Well, gotcha. And when we say under the law, are we referring to the judgments of the law? Or are we just saying um, trying to keep every statue, every jot and tittle? Okay. So we say it as trying to keep the law, sacrificial, mm -hmm. um, ceremonial, all mm -hmm. of those things, right? Keeping the Sabbath mm -hmm. day. Well, we rest in Christ today. So mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't rest in the day. We rest in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell right. us that we have to abstain from pork. That was to Israel. And unless you know that it was to Israel, Acts 15 clears that up. And then mm -hmm. Acts 15, 26 says the Holy Spirit saw that no other thing should be put on you. So when we're talking about this time frame right now, which is the church age dealing with the body of Christ, you cannot go back into history and put people back before Christ after Christ has come, fulfilled, and died on the cross for, this, for people's sins. You can't gotcha. do that. So, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, follow me as I follow Christ, um, and that's uh, Shaul or Paul talking, right? Uh, was he referring to, um, you know, the different feast days that he attended? Because, you know, we know he went to do Passover in Jerusalem. Um, we know that he reasoned with the scriptures on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. Um, and we know that Yeshua did the same thing, right? So are we to also reject those things, or do we parse out uh, what we believe attains to us as being Gentiles, or should we just take everything that Paul did as an example to follow? When he says, follow me as I follow Christ, what he was talking mm -hmm. about is the things that he was currently doing. Nowhere in there is it going to tell you that you have to go back and do the things. Now, this is what the word says. If mm -hmm. your brother chooses not to eat, don't offend him for not eating. So, if you decide you don't want to eat pork, guess what? Mm -hmm. Fine. I don't. I don't. I don't. I have nothing to say because the Word of God tells me you have nothing to say whether that man eats pork or whether he wants to keep the Sabbath day. He can do it. The problem is when you get dogmatic and go out and try to teach other people that they have to do it. That's mm -hmm. what the Word of God says. So now, mm -hmm. people can come in 
and you could keep the Sabbath day, and you could choose to eat or not eat. But when you go forth and you teach other people that this is the way and this is the stipulations that they have to do, you are in error because the Bible does not support that. No man trumps the word of God. Gotcha. So uh, are you, would you say that all Jews are going to hell? What I say, all Jews is going to hell. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking, I said, would you say that all Jews are going to hell? No, why would I say that? No, I'm asking, you know, the ones who don't uh, accept Jesus as the Messiah, um, do you think that they're going to hell? Is that your position? If the, absolutely. If they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they're going to hell. Did Judas accept him? No, he didn't. He did not believe. And he was a Jew. And okay. where was his place made? In hell. Mm. So all so those you, who are in unbelief go to hell. Period. So Judas, Whether Jew Judas, or Gentile. Judas is in hell, you're saying, right? That's what the Bible I didn't. I never read that verse where it says that Judas was in hell. Do you have a, a scriptural reference for that? Thank you, pardon. Yeah. Do you have a scriptural reference where it says that Judas is in hell? No, I don't have to have a direct reference. We know he didn't believe. So therefore, it we can. It tells you mm -hmm. that he does not. That he did not believe, and that his that he has already set his place before him. Now, does it say directly that he went to hell? Nope. It don't say it directly. Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 29, 29 says the secret things belong to God, but it gives us inf enough information to let us know that's where he went because he was mm -hmm. what? In unbelief. All unbelievers go where? To hell. That mm -hmm. is doctrine. Gotcha. The, so uh, hell, when, when Jesus was talking about hell, right, he's referring to um, Gehenna, which we can relate back to the Valley of Shinnah, right? Uh, do you believe that when he was speaking to the people, when they looked at that refuge valley where garbage was being thrown and burnt up, that he was actually making a reference to the destruction of non-believers as opposed to a literal place where people were making their bed in hell and they'd be burning and being tortured? I just, I I just to look, kind of look at on that. Okay, I will have to look at the scripture directly, okay. but here it is. Revelation 20 lets uh -huh. you know that people will go into a physical hell. Revelation 19 where the uh the false the the feast and the false prophet are thrown mm -hmm. directly in hell alive lets us know that they will be thrown in hell and that they are not tortured in hell but they are tormented there's a difference but it's referring no only but it's referring only to those two uh entities it's not saying that everybody is a whole bunch of people in there burning up it doesn't say that right okay so here's the thing here's another mm -hmm. example luke 16 sure. lazarus and the rich man the rich okay. man comes, to, the rich man had everything that he needed, right? Oh, I'm sorry, the young rich ruler. The young rich ruler, he was a believer, an uh, unbeliever, right? Then you got yeah. the same thing with Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man had everything, right? Mm -hmm. Right. He was, he was in, I can't say exactly where he was, but it shows you that what? He was an unbeliever, and he mm -hmm. went to hell, period. Okay. Hell is a, an actual place where you go. Okay. There's no getting around that. Gotcha. So, um, and that's that you said that was the young rich ruler, or are you referring to Luke chapter 16, the last few verses where it's talking about Lazarus and um, there was Lazarus. The, that's oh, the way you're talking about Luke 16, right? Luke 16 is dealing with Lazarus and the rich man. Is that I'm what you were sure referring to? Young rich ruler. Right. As far as proving that the hell doctrine exists. Gotcha. Okay, I got you, Elder. All right. So, um, and this is uh, Jesus speaking literally, right, of an event. He's not speaking figuratively. He's not speaking, you know, using any kind of literary device that we would read today. Um, this is what he's saying, right? Ipsima uh, box, his actual voice that he's speaking, right? You said what? So um, there is uh, something called um, Ipsima box and a piece of verba or box of verma. So what these things refer to is that when we read the scriptures or the New Testament, um, we're either reading the exact words of Yeshua or mm -hmm. we're reading his voice that has been paraphrased somehow for a written narrative. So um, if we're examining Luke chapter 16, and I'm mm -hmm. saying uh, from the way we, we exegete it, can we uh, safely assume that he's speaking literally and not figuratively? Like this is his actual words, verba, that he's saying and not just his voice, which is implied after the writer put it down in the manuscript. All right. So then here we go. This is how we cover this. Sure. Second Timothy 3, 3, 16. All scriptures inspired by God. So whether the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit inspired them to write it, it's truth. Gotcha. 
So that that's the catch all for that, right? It's truth, right? It's inspired by God, correct? Does God um, lie? Does God well, lie? According to the book of Nebar Numbers, it says that God cannot lie, right? So therefore, it's um, truth. Gotcha. But at the same time, there is an exegetical method that we utilize to properly interpret what the context is um, that's being conveyed, correct? Would you agree to that? Sure. What, what, what uh, exegetical treatment would you want to put to it? Gotcha. So there's a way that we have to determine whether it's figurative or literal language. Um, mm -hmm. When you go into the original language, you can determine that and or looking from the context um, or culturally and historically based on the background of what the speaker is saying to the audience and what would have been understood to them at that time and not in our contemporary mindset, what we would have perceived that they would understand. So there's a particular context that we have to interpret it within without this pretext of the subtext to kind of like ascertain what is being conveyed there. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying um, I would like to know what methods that you apply to the text for Luke chapter 16, the last few verses, in order for you to determine that that is a literal statement for something that's happening or if it's something that's figurative that's used to warn the people not to um, mistreat the poor amongst them. Because that idea is something that they get from Torah. Torah tells you to take care of the needy, the oppressed, the poor, etc. So once we look at the audience to see that these people that he's speaking to of his, his same ethnic origin as him, they would have understood this, so therefore he could have been put in thought a particular figurative in order for them to disdain not taking care of the poor because they keep on having fat and gluttonous when they had the Romans over them and they were able to get money and they were believing certain people right away from them. You see a similar example of that in the Good Samaritan when he is you know, the people are just walking by this Jew that had got beat up and robbed on the side. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot of people like to spiritualize that, but in the context of the people, they have strayed away from even keeping the basic tenets of Torah, and therefore he wanted to re-emphasize what those things were by telling these parables so that the people would really understand. Right? So these are just this is just him speaking to his audience. Now, outside of his audience is a little bit different. Um, do you have any uh, scriptures, if you don't mind sharing with me, uh, while uh, Yeshua was alive, uh, where he spoke to a Gentile and welcomed them into salvation? When he talked to the uh, Samaritan woman. he talked woman. to any Gentile and welcomed them into well, salvation? Well, here's the thing, right? Uh -huh. What does the scriptures tell us over in Isaiah? That he would go to the Gentiles, right? And that he would preach salvation. You see that in the book of Isaiah. But like I said, I'm outside walking. But no, it's, it's, I thing. understand. Here, I mean, I'm, I'm freestyling too. I'm not. I'm not reading no books or anything. I'm just. Okay. I'm doing it off the dome. So, so but here's, yeah, the, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. If I say it and I get in front of my Bible, guess what? Just like I'm saying, it's in the book of Isaiah. It's prophesied mm -hmm. that he will go to the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. The Gentiles will welcome in. First and foremost, we have to understand this. Genesis one through eleven is not talking to Hebrews, nor is it talking to Israelites at all. Okay. This thing that Christ came was because of what? Because the fall of Adam. Because the fall of man. Mm -hmm. Not because of the fall of a nation. Because, mm -hmm. of, the, because of the fall of mankind. So okay. until people start to realize that's why Christ came, then they're always going to have this false narrative. Oh, it was only for Israel. Matter of fact, uh, Isaiah 49, 6 lets you know it's prophesied that Israel was to be a light to all the nations, but they failed at their job. They didn't do it. So then Christ came, not only redeemed Israel, but redeemed the world. And then the body of Christ is the current active, uh, active solution to receive salvation. You don't so see nobody of, saying being drafted into Israel. You have to be drafted into Christ and Christ alone. Well, so Romans, when Romans, uh, Paul speaking of Romans chapter 11, mm -hmm. About the mm -hmm. graphing in, into the tree. What does that tree represent? Who's, who's that tree, tree representing? The tree was representing Israel. But here's the thing. What does it okay. tell you in Romans chapter 11? That it clearly lets you know that Israel ain't nothing but a branch. And that Gentiles that's drafted in ain't nothing but a branch. And that you can do absolutely nothing without the root, which is Christ. So now you could be Israel all day, but you can't do nothing okay. without Christ. Period. That's what that is talking about in Romans 11. Gotcha. So when the book of Genesis, that who, who wrote the book of Genesis? Abraham. I believe Abraham. Abraham uh, wrote it? Uh, I mean, not Moses, Abraham. Right? Uh, Moses. Moses. Yes, Moses. Okay. 
So uh, Moses uh, scribed the Pumash, which is the first five books of uh, the Bible, right? What some people call the Pentateuch or the Pumash, which means five. So he wrote that. Now, when he wrote that, um, was he under Christ at that time? Was Moses under Christ when he wrote Correct. it? What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean the, by was he, he under the revelation? Christ? Did he have the revelation of Jesus Christ when he wrote that? He had faith in God. He was led oh. by God. Okay. So it's so, by faith. It ain't about whether he had revelation of Christ. It's about did he have faith in God? Because so, even Abraham okay. had faith in God before he was preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he was justified, because he had what? Faith in God. But we can't have that same, to, But we can't have that same faith today because that would exclude Christ, correct? Would it exclude Christ? Yeah, the gospel is there now. The gospel is preached. It's to be preached. Period. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. So um, so uh, when you get a chance, when we have like a more formal discussion, um, whenever mm -hmm. you would like, you can sit down, you can have your Bible and your resources in front of you, and I'll, I'll have mine as well. I'm just, you know, I'm just having a plenary discussion with you. I've seen that you seem to be pretty reasonable, um, and I see that you're an elder, so I want to show the utmost respect for you, uh, whether we disagree or not. Um, and at the same time, I just got a, you know, a couple of questions that I'm asking just so I can uh, kind of better assess what your position is. And um, if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them as sure. well. So if you got tell another, the sure. Please tell the audience what your beliefs are. Uh, as far as what? As far as the law, as mm -hmm. far as preaching Hebrew, uh, as far as preaching nationality. Okay. All of that. How, what is salvation to you? What do you okay. preach as far as salvation? Mm -hmm. Should anything be added to the word of God or not? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So the first thing you asked me is that you want me to tell the people, um, uh, what was the first thing? I know you said nationality was second. The first thing was... What, um, what law. are your belief systems? Okay. Yeah, should you so, preach the law? Gotcha. So um, when we look at the, the reference to the word law in the New Testament, when we go into the original language, which is Koine Greek, some references to the law is made without the definite article and some is made with the definite article. Um, that's a very interesting study. There's a couple of, uh, you know, sources that speak on that um, to explain what is the intent of the author in writing that and refer referring to the law. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, the environment that has been paved for the New Testament to be written was based on things that occurred to the Israelites outside the realm of their sovereignty. So when I look at the what's called the law or the mitzvah, um, that is a cultural mandate that has been placed upon those ethnic group of people for them to uphold and for them to maintain. The issue was when the religious leaders started to impose other things onto the people is when it became difficult. So if we want to look for, let's say, a reference in order to uh, speak about what's called the law, right? And uh, again, that is a, a very wide um, application because well, even when we read it, the book of Genesis, go ahead. let's keep it specific. The law of Moses. Yeah, yeah the law of Moses. So that was a mm -hmm. cultural mandate that was given to the community so they can set up a theocracy when they established themselves in the land of Canaan. Right. So what happened was that was only supposed to be in that format as long as they're sovereign in the land. When they lost their sovereignty, there were certain things that they were subjected to by the powers that be that was over them. So therefore, in even dealing with the law, what's called the law, there was an oral law that was going through during that time that then found its way uh, through judgments in the Mishnah and then commentary from the Gemara and became the Talmud. And there were things that were still prevalent based on what the people believed from the written Torah, right? What, they, what people would say at that time, they received it by Moshe. So when we're looking at what's called the law, it's really a cultural mandate for the Israelites to utilize to establish a theocracy in the land of Canaan while in their sovereignty. When they're no longer in their sovereignty, whether they're going to be scattered or whether they're going to be uh, have some other entity over them and be a vassal uh, province, uh, province, things change. So when we tell, so when I teach people uh, what is what we call the law, it's really a cultural mandate that the culture is dictating in order for the people to do right by each other and to do right in their service before the most time. So, please. So, then I'll ask, so I will ask again. <laughs> sure. Do you tell people, do you teach people to be up under the law of Moses? 
And what I'm saying is that people cannot be under the law of Moses if they're not sovereign in the land of Canaan today. So I don't teach that. What okay, I teach is that what I teach is that what's called the law is really cultural mandates that we can extract those who identify ethnically with Israel and that you can apply today. And this is where you get the development of Halakha that helps to account for some of the great areas that cannot be accomplished today, with one of them being given a sacrifice to the priest. Now, the law, when we think about the law, all anytime the law was broken, quote unquote, everything did not pertain to a capital offense. There's a set amount of capital offenses. Everything else outside of that is not a capital offense. I'll give you an example. If a person decides they want to eat pork, pork is not punishable by death. It makes you unclean. And therefore, when you are unclean, you are going against the ecological fence that has been created to ensure that when the people are sovereign in the land, that they're ensuring that they're not absorbing or eating or consuming the items that will prevent the land from decomposing properly, not having carcasses in the streets and so forth. So these were items that were used to clean the land and therefore you should not eat it because when you do, you make your body unclean. Even when we look scientifically and consuming pork, we see that there's a lot of issues with consuming pork over other animals that have multiple stomachs and various ways in which they process through the gastrointestinal tract of the foods in which they eat. Uh, when we look at uh, pork, or well, the porcine diet of swine, we see that they don't eat in the same capacity if animals have split hooks in the same way that you would see cattle or something else. Things are slightly different. So we're teaching a template of culture to get people to reenact what their ancestors utilized in their sovereignty and find a way to apply it today so we can yield results. And this is not nullifying looking at Yeshua bar Yosef and the things that he laid down and incorporating for that so we can have a better pathway for Yah. So it's a... so. To answer your question plainly, the law and the sovereignty cannot be upheld because Israelites are not in the sovereignty of land. What's called the state of Israel today is not represented with the sovereignty of land. It is a hope and something that has been granted to them. All right, I'm back. So that hopefully that answers your question. If not, when, when we sit down and talk, you can ask more specific questions, and I can definitely address them for you, okay? So the second thing you asked me after the right, law, here, here, the here, here, here. about nationality. Here, we'll do, okay, we'll just do one more. We'll just do one sure. more, and then I'm going to break off. Here's the last thing. No problem. Is the nation of Israel an enemy to the gospel today? The nation of Israel? Um, yes. When you, when you say nation of Israel, who does that consist of? You talking about people in that diaspora or the people that's there? No, no, I'm talking right about now? as far as what the Bible teaches, period. Not because the Bible says that Israel has been spread to the four corners of the world. Okay. What the, the simple question is this. Is the nation of Israel an enemy to the gospel of Jesus Christ today? If you're talking about Jews who don't believe in the Messiah, then they would be considered that. Is that what you're referring to? Right. So then that, okay, okay. exactly. And, and those who, the nation, period. So that's anybody yeah. who, who calls themselves Israel, right? Like I said when we first started, the Bible states that at this time, that is very unimportant. The only thing that's important is that you are in the body of Christ. So let me ask you a question, Elder. So, mm -hmm. Elder, if... Do you believe in uh, end time prophecy? Of course I do. Okay, so you have an eschatological model that you follow, correct? Definitely. All right. So do you believe in the end times that there's going to be uh, separate things that's going to pertain to the Jews as opposed to the spiritual Israel or the church? What do you mean by spiritual Israel? The church. People who are Gentiles that have been grafted in that is not ethnically born an Israelite. So you, you say that's spiritual Israel. Well, there, at end time prophecy, there's definitely things that are different for the nation of Israel mm -hmm. and the church. Over gotcha. in Revelation chapter 2, it is, I believe, mm -hmm. he lets you know that the wrath of God shall not come upon the church, but the wrath of God definitely comes upon the nation of Israel. Okay, gotcha. So the church will only be Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and as their Lord and Savior, correct? 
incorrect. That's not what the church is. The church is so not just the church? Gentiles. The church is all believing Jews and all believing Gentiles who are in the Messiah. That's what the church is. Gotcha. So the ecclesia we'll be talking about, right? Not really that mm -hmm. word church comes from Cersei. But the word ecclesia are the ones that have been called out, right? Those individuals, uh -huh. that's the ones we're referring to, right? Exactly. So um, with, the, with the believing uh, nation, people who are part of the nation of Israel, the ones who believe in the Messiah, um, the judgment that they're going to get is going to be separate from the non-believing Jews, correct? Say that one more time. Sure. So the um, the... Jews that believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, um, the judgment that they're going to receive is going to be distinct from the Jews that do not believe in the Messiah, correct? And when you say in Jews, I just I, I just can't, uh, I can't hold on to that because, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3 says, once you're in Christ, there is no Jew, there is no Greek. So those Christians who may have been part of that bloodline will not receive those things that the nation will receive. Because the Bible strictly says there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no male or female. We are all one in Christ. So we don't show any distinction at all. That's the word of gotcha. God. So, so, then that, so they're no longer ethnically Jews once they believe in the Messiah, you're saying, correct? Whether they are ethnically Jews or not, the Bible says they are no longer Jews. Deuteronomy so 29, it, 29, do not add so, or subtract. So, so when it says no male or female, does that mean mm -hmm. that they're no longer gender-based? No, says it's that saying too? that we are all one in Christ. And as in the body of Christ, we yeah. all work unified for the one thing, to preach the gospel. Not to preach ourselves, not mm -hmm. to attain to our flesh, not okay. to show our, uh, our, dec our degrees of who we are. Like Paul mm -hmm. said in Philippians 3, I was a what? A Hebrew of Hebrews. Of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he says, what? I count all that as dung. That is the example. So mm -hmm. if men want to do something different than Paul, when you first said, follow me as I follow Christ, how did Paul follow Christ? He didn't have to give you no, uh, no background of who he was. He said, I'm a mm -hmm. follower, period. So when we get so, outside of that realm, we in error. Mm -hmm. So did Jesus cast everything uh, away as well when he was alive? What do you mean did Jesus cast everything when, away? When Jesus was here, because, you know, Jesus is the model example according to Christian theology, right? When we're looking at systematic theology of Christianity, Jesus is the center figure. Um, did Jesus or Yeshua, did he cast out in a way all of his ethnic ties um, as well as his... Um, is keeping of the law because you know some people say that the reason why Jesus uh, was perfect example because he kept the law. Why why would Jesus need to keep something that has already been done away with? Now it's not about him keeping something that's that had already been done away with. First okay. of all, the law was not made for Christ. Period. Christ was mm -hmm. born under the law. Christ was perfect. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a sinner. The law was made for a sinful man. Mm -hmm. Christ came to redeem Israel from the curse of the law. So okay. it's not about him doing away with anything. It's the purpose that he came to what? Mm -hmm. Bring salvation. So did, did Jesus did Jesus ever teach the people to follow the law of Moses? I got you. Go back in there. Come here. Okay, you got it. Go ahead. Go in the room. The other piece is in the room. I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so did Jesus ever teach the people to keep the law? Of course he taught them to keep the law. Well, when did why he would you do that? Be, ah, That's not because because deception. He had That's not, not like no, deception. No, it's not deception. Right? What happens okay. is this. Mm -hmm. Men always want to go to the book of Matthew, what do you want to Mark, Luke, where Jesus said, keep the law, and if anyone breaks the law, he shall be least in the kingdom. Okay. And he actually said that before he got on the cross and fulfilled it. So to so try to died, jump back there, uh -huh. so for those who try to <laughs> manipulate the scripture, and try to make it as if, oh, well, Jesus said keep the law. Yes, he did say keep the law before he fulfilled the law. And after he fulfilled the law, it lets you know that he did what? He nailed it to the cross. So, yeah, before he died, of course, he's not going to say anything opposite. And then after he fulfills the law, he lets you know that what? We already know Galatians 3.24 says the law was our schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to who? To Christ. So then after the law is fulfilled, we should all go to where? To Christ. That's Bible. 
Gotcha. So that that's again referencing Paul. And I understand that because Paul, you know, he has a later revelation. He wrote a lost portion of the New Testament. But I'm just referring to Jesus and Yeshua right now. When he after he died and he resurrected, um, you know, because we have uh, references in a narrative where he reappears and he speaks to the disciples. Did he ever tell them to stop following the law? Once again, I'll say it like this. If you, uh, here's a better one, right? He's okay. saying, did he ever teach them to not follow the law? And it depends, because that's a broad spectrum, what you're trying to put out there. Did he ever teach them not to keep the law, depending on yeah. which part you're talking about? But the thing is this. You can try to keep the law. Okay. And if you're trying to keep the law to be justified, then Galatians 5 and 4 crucifies you, because it says what? He who tries to be justified from keeping the law has estranged or divorced himself from Christ. So if you divorce yourself from Christ, guess what? The efficacious work of the blood on the cross is none effective to you, which means you have to stand in front of God. And if you broke one law, you broke them all. That's so when Paul, was, when Paul was writing that in context, was he writing it to Jews and Gentiles or just Gentiles? Who was the book of Galatians written to? It was written to the church of Galatia. So I'm asking you, was he so writing then in to the church Jews of Galatia? And what do you have? You have Jews and Gentiles in the church. Well, well, when you read the book of Galatians chapter 2, he says he was sent specifically to those who are uncircumcised, and that was the right hand of fellowship that was given to him by the two pillars okay, that was in the church. what does it say in chapter 1? So, so, Galatians so 1, I'm asking, I marvel that you uh -huh, have turned from mm -hmm. the gospel of Christ to another gospel. Right? And he's speaking to Gentiles, out as, right? That's the context of Galatians chapter 1. Sorry, that's Galatians chapter 1. So right, the first thing he addresses is what? The gospel of Christ. Not the law. Um, the gospel. Okay. I marvel that you are turning to another gospel, which mm -hmm. is not the gospel of Christ. But mm -hmm. some will want to pervert you. So all these things I brought up tonight is a point of perversion. If it's not mm -hmm. the gospel and you add anything into it, you have perverted the gospel of Christ. First Corinthians gotcha. 15, so, 4. So, so Galatians, Galatians, when he's writing it, he's recounting the incident that occurred at Acts chapter 15, correct? Could be. I'm not absolutely sure. Because it's talking about the Juda the Judaizers, right? So the Judaizers was trying to get Gentiles, um, and a lot of them were Pharisees that had converted, uh, trying to get Gentiles to keep the law and to be circumcised before they can accept Yeshua, correct? You said that they were trying to get them to I'm sorry. One more time. Yeah, so no problem. So breaking Acts 15, up a little, breaking up a little bit. No problem. So Acts fifteen is where we have the first council at Jerusalem, right? And at exactly. this council, Paul has a Gentile with him. And now we have a situation where there were some Pharisees that had converted. And those Pharisees were trying to get those Gentiles to keep the law and to be circumcised before accepting Christ, correct? Yes. Okay. So Not that Paul they had already accepted Christ, but they were trying to get them to be circumcised even though they accepted Christ. Gotcha. In so, addition to Christ. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So when that incident occurred, um, it's, it's making a reference to the Gentiles, correct? Because the Jews were already being circumcised as part of their custom, correct? Yeah. Okay. So when we so when we when we perform exegesis and we go back into Galatians chapter one and we go into Galatians chapter two, the context of who he's referring to are the Gentiles who were being seduced by the Pharisees to be circumcised and keep the law, he was speaking against that. Correct? So, so let, me ask, when ask, you... ask, let me ask you this. Sure. Go ahead, Elder. Is all, is all things that uh, Christ, uh, uh, all things that Paul written for the church, does it not go for the whole church? Uh, certain things don't pertain to those who are Jews. Thank you, pardon? Certain things don't pertain to those who are Jews. What things don't pertain to those who are Jews? The what things, things that, that specifically relate to Gentiles, as in the example of Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2, which we just brought up. Okay, so can you show us those things that don't pertain, that pertain to Gentiles, that don't pertain to Jews? So Paul would never tell a Jew not to get circumcised. No, that's he not what I asked. I said, can you show us or yeah, tell us a scripture? Okay, tell us so a scripture I, that we can reference. That shows us that those things in the body of Christ uh -huh. that don't pertain to Jews, okay, but only pertain to Gentiles. All right. So this is us again. If you now, if you want me, I could pull out the Bible. If you're okay with that, 
and just read the scripture I'm for almost, you. I'm almost back to the house. Okay, no problem. So Galatians uh, chapter 2, we have a situation where he's talking, he opens up and says, 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem accompanied by Barnabas. I took Titus also. Um, I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I spoke privately to those recognized as leaders for fear that I was running or I had run in vain. So at that point, Paul wasn't even sure if he was a certified apostle, right? So he had some doubt um, within um, that context. Are, are, right? are you sure that that's what he's saying? I'm, I'm positive. He's not so sure? You go back and read it. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is what he's saying here. Um, he said it was because of revelation that he went up and he submitted to them the gospel, which he preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. This is what Paul is saying. So even 14 years into doing what he was doing, he still wasn't sure if his actions and what he was doing was in vain or not. This is why the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 was extremely important because it helped for him to verify what his role was. And this, is, this goes back to what I was saying about what pertains to Jews and what pertains to Gentiles and the works of Paul. But it goes on to say, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy our liberty that we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even as uh, an hour in, in an hour so that the truth of the gospel remained amongst you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, here it goes, seeing that I've been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. You can read it again, that he was entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed as pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we may go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing also I was eager to do. So Paul is laying out in the book of Galatians that you had referenced initially that his role in the apostleship, because initially for 14 years he wasn't sure if he was running in vain, was that, okay, I'm supposed to go to the Gentiles because it was verified and validated by Peter, James, and John. So when I say that when we're reading the, 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 what Paul is laying out, Paul may have very well have wisdom in there for people who are Jews, but he tells you specifically that he was sent to go to the uncircumcised. Hence why, if somebody who's uncircumcised is trying to go another route to be circumcised, and his mission was to speak a, a form of the gospel to them, then that would be error. But he's not speaking against anybody who's already ethnically an Israelite and who's already keeping the law. He's not condemning that. He's saying for the so, Gentiles... So... Uh -huh. Now that goes, um, um, <laughs> that goes back into back into Pharisaic... Uh, concepts and ideas where we look at the Noahide laws. And in the Noahide laws, when they speak in Acts chapter 15, they're referencing three of the seven Noahide laws that was given to all of humanity that believed that it was given to Noah and his three sons and their wives when they repopulated the earth that if they followed these seven things that they would be righteous before Yah. This was in the cultural and social memory of these people who are preaching this gospel. So therefore, when Peter was making his judgment and James came behind him, they gave them three specific commandments that if the Gentiles keep these things, they will be right before Yah. This is something that's done if you look at Pharisaic or any kind of Orthodox Judaism, where it says that any Gentiles that are trying to be right before Yah and the God of Israel, there are seven things that was commissioned that they need to keep. And if they keep these things, they will be righteous. And if they decide they want to keep the law on top of that, there would be no error in that. But when we get to the New Testament era, the issue is if you take that and put the, that cultural mandate above following what Christ had left behind to get you back in alignment with that so you can follow Yah, then that's when it becomes error. So when I say Paul was writing specifically to the Gentiles, his message had to wait for the Gentiles. He's saying this right here in Galatians chapter 2 within context. That's all I want to share with you. Uh, all right. So... Uh, 
Here we go. Now, Will, he just said, too, sure. that he showed no, no partiality, right? Yes, he was saying that so, in regards to himself because he felt that at that time they were not respecting him. And we've seen that you, he did not you get respected. You, see, you can see all of that in the scripture, or you, are you eisegeting the text? No, I'm not eisegeting anything. So exegetically speaking, we can use several methods to identify and ascertain what's going on. So in the ministry of Paul, which we're talking about right now, which we see in a narrative form that Luke wrote in the book of Acts, as opposed to what he's writing firsthand in the book of Galatians, we see that when Paul, I mean, was, he was initially converted, he did not meet the apostles when he was initially converted. It took him almost 14 years before he went to Jerusalem to meet the elders there. He, he okay. wasn't told yeah. before then by the apostles or the pillars of the church or the ecclesia, hey, you can go, Paul, go out and preach this gospel to the Gentiles. He had to get it confirmed at that council in Jerusalem. Now, his revelation of Jesus wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You sure. say he had to get that confirmed, right? First of all, correct. They went Correct. up there to look at it, but let's we're gonna gross this Galatians sure. two again. All right. No problem. Starting at verse one, it says, "Then okay. after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem by Barnabas, and also took Titus with me. And mm -hmm. I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles." Right. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. went and gave them revelation. Of what mm -hmm. Christ had gave him, that thing which was revealed, right? Okay, right. Keep reading. It says, mm -hmm. but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain, right? But can you, can you, can you exegete that, that Elder? Can you uh, exegete I'm sure that I can. Elder? And okay. it says that, it says, lest by any means I might run and had run in vain. Well, we know that they were all what? They were all in fear of Paul because he was currently persecuting the church. So when we try to make some new narrative that's not there, that's not true. Because we see oh. that at, at Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9, we see where Paul was first persecuting the church, and then after his conversion, he had to be set aside because what? They were in fear of Paul. So this is not saying... So wait, 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 that, wait. So hold on, Elder. Hold on, Elder. This is not saying anything about anybody fearing Paul. Paul's talking about himself. He uh -huh. says... It was by revelation that he went up and submitted them the gospel, which he preached unto the Gentiles. But he did so privately to those mm -hmm. who have a reputation. And this referred to the pillars, who was James, John, Cephas. He says, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. So he had to go and consult with them and give them the revelation that was given to him when he went to Jerusalem sure. to confirm that? that he was not running in vain. Because this so, was 14 years have passed since he had the if revelation. This, if this is Paul's mindset, then show us in the scripture that he mm -hmm. had to go and he had to confer with them because the Bible tells you he didn't have to confer with anybody Acts, because he got, he got it right from Christ. Gotcha. So let's go to Acts chapter 15, Elder. Mm -hmm. And let me know when you get it. Mm -hmm. I'm there. All right. So Acts chapter 15. It says, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. And I'm using a New American Standard Bible. Um, what version are you using so I could be on the same page? New King James. New King James? All right. Uh, let me get New King James. Give me one second. I want to make sure that we're on the same page, right? And we're reading the same thing, okay? So New King James and Acts 15. Okay. All right. So it says, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, um, what this is implying here very clearly is that Paul and Barnabas did not have the final word on this. So this is why well, they, what went is, what to, is, what, they went there to confirm what? What does the they scripture went there, say? Yeah, they went there the to confirm to about confirm the circumcision. What? Yeah, they went there to confirm about the circumcision being circumcised before you can be saved. Boom, that, that's it. That's what they went for. Yeah, that's what they went for, but we're, we're okay. not finished, right? So as right, we keep exactly. reading, it's, yeah, as we keep reading, it says, um, Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them 
and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, remember, he mentioned now, in chapter 2, he had Titus with him, right? I got a question. So, question, okay, right? Yeah. So now, here it is. Now, they're telling you that you have to do what? Be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, right? Correct. This is now, what was we, said in Acts chapter 15 and 1. and what we talk That about we talked about. Correct. This is something that we talked about earlier. So now, what right. I want to say is this. We had, we had Acts so at fi Acts 15, 26, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit does not tell you that you go and keep the law of Moses. And who was it talking about? Who was, well, who was in error it, here? The Pharisees. Well, that's, that's not what I had said. I said that we're talking about Paul's audience. That's what we're referring to right now. Okay. Um, so, oh, I, I, so we're going to get, we're gonna get back saying. here. No, I got you. I, I, I'm saying Paul still had to subject himself to the authority of the other pillars in the church that was there, even though he had received the revelation by Jesus Christ. So we don't that. need to yeah, see that he had to do that. We don't need to yeah, see he, that because the things he did, he did that was revealed that to Paul were, he were they, didn't even, that they didn't even understand those things because it wasn't yeah, revealed you. to them. But they was not respecting Paul's um, apostleship. So in order for Paul's apostleship to be respected, it had to be confirmed here by the okay, pillars of the okay, church, which listen. he referenced in Galatians chapter 2 and what we're about to read in Acts here, chapter 15. Here's the thing. When you uh -huh. say things like they didn't respect it, you don't mm -hmm. have any verses that tell you that they didn't respect him. So let's read it again. That's, um, let's read it again, Elder. I got you. So uh, let's read it again, Elder. All right. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined who the brethren came down from Judea, that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Why couldn't Paul and Barnabas at that time adjudicate over the matter and make a final decision? Now, here's the thing. Sure. What you're doing right now is you're adding a human argument into it. The Bible only tells us that mm -hmm. this is what was done. Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? Don't listen. The, the okay, secret I'm things belong you. to God. The whole okay. thing is this. If God don't tell you that, then don't add that in there because it's not saying that they didn't respect him or anything. It's just telling you the occurrence of what happened. So if we're looking at the narrative for the occurrence of what happened, can you please exegete with me and interpret verse 2? Why, why, why were they sending Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem so that way they can confer with the apostles and elders about the question? Why wasn't Paul and Barnabas, why didn't their apostleship have enough authority to adjudicate over this matter? Why did they have to go to um, okay, so Jerusalem? That's, I, I'm just asking is. you why, Elder. You're asking the question, but here's the thing, I, and I'll sure. say it again. After I read it, therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, that's all the information the Bible gives, whether how they felt about it or whether they felt they respected Paul or whether you think Paul had to go to them. They went up there to ask a question. It had nothing to do with whether Paul had authority about what he was saying or not, because the Bible does not give you that information. And the so problem that Paul, we have at, at this point, did Paul have authority to answer that question? Well, he, and, and once again, that's your human logic saying, did he have authority? What they said was this. They're going to go. What he's going to do is go reveal to them. What was revealed to him from Christ directly, something that none of them knew. This was special revelation given to Paul. So then he said, we're going to go up and we're going to talk about it. But when you start to add in there that, oh, they didn't respect him or, or he couldn't answer. You don't know that. That's okay. not in the text. OK, I got you. So, like I said, we, we anybody can go back and read Galatians chapter two and exegete that for themselves. And they'll see this is what Paul is saying. But here in Acts chapter 15, the reason why. Paul spoke privately to those who were of high reputation. The text is talking about something in particular because he wanted to confirm for fear that he may have been running in vain or had run in vain. So there's a form of confirmation that he needed to receive in order for him to get the right hand of fellowship from the pillars of the church in order to continue on with his assignment. So if we continue to read here, and I'll go to Acts chapter 15, I'm going to read verse uh, 15 and verse 6. It says, Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose us amongst us, God chose amongst us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
So God, who knows the hearts, acknowledged them by giving them the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, just as he did with us. And he's referring back to the incident in Acts chapter 10. It says, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them amongst the Gentiles. So we see a dissertation by Peter in order to calm the people to receive the message that Paul and Barnabas were doing prior to them arriving at that point. It Do says Simon that had the text? cleared. You, is ahead. that in the text? Is that in it's the text? In the text. Okay, let's, let's hear. Because it seems sure. like you keep wanting to give your dissertation as if the Bible is not plain enough, right? Acts chapter 15, verse, I'll start at verse 8. It says, so God, who knows the heart. Matter of fact, I want to start back here at verse, uh, verse 7. It says, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us and made no distinction between us and them. Now, your whole premise this time was that what? There were certain things that was for the Jews that wasn't for the Gentiles. But right here, the word of God says there's no distinction between them or us. It Purifying says there's no their distinction. Hearts by father. Yeah, it says. Ethnically, it says, ethnically so God, there's no and distinction. The, and, and here's the problem. That you mm -hmm. want to that you want to add eth ethnically into Christ. All of these people are going into Christ, into one body. There is no ethnically in Christ. We are all one in Christ. You don't see ethnicity added in Christ. So, so why did the apostles and Paul still keep the Sabbath, still uh, attend the feast days? Why are they still doing these things? If these things, because um, these are not things that doing. they grew up doing. Now, once again, the Bible does not say that they cannot go to feast days and that they, they cannot practice these things. The problem that you're going to have is, like I said before, that when you go forth and you start to preach people this now, you have a, these people were accustomed to those things. Those are things okay. that they did. But Paul Correct. says what? That to the Jew I became a Jew, which means I did things that the Jews did. And to the Gentiles I became Gentiles. But he was already what? a Jew. To where, so he can, whether he so was wait. already a Jew or not, all we're doing is sticking to the text. And what is the premise of the text? That Paul went forth to win all men to Christ, period. That's what but, he went but, to do. Wait, but but and, do you and see, it's here's the thing, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. do you see after that, that Paul went and started classifying, oh, ethnically, I need to teach them this, and ethnically, no, that's not the example that, that Paul gave. Paul didn't give that example. So when you get men today wanting to start to say, ethnically, I need to do this, you don't see that example in the Bible. That is error. So wait, let me ask you a question. So if I'm a Christian, and let's say I come from uh, Nigeria, and that there's customs and practices that I do within the worldview of my culture, is that wrong to do? That what does that have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you so, add it to what, the gospel, if you're adding it to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you are incorrect. Gotcha. And so those people there who do not accept Jesus Christ, that they're all going to hell as well, correct? If they don't accept Jesus Christ, that's what the Bible says. Everybody anybody who does not confess, no. anybody who does not confess and believe will not go to heaven. Period. I gotcha. So going back to the it's interesting that you said um, Paul said he became all things to all men so that he may win some. Um, it's interesting that he didn't say that, oh, to all people I came one particular way. That's not true. He had to make distinctions in regards to the people that he approached. So that way the message he's trying to convey can be received by them. He never told any Jews to stop following the law. He, when he speaks to the Gentiles, he's telling them, you guys don't need to keep the law because it had already been decided in Acts chapter 15 that you just keep the three tenets that was prescribed to you. And the law is something that will be a weight on top of you. This is, this is what he's saying when he's expressed so, himself to the, the church. So then, let me ask you this. Sure. You've been here. You've been in, in, in America your whole life. Correct. Uh, was your customs those customs of the Jews? Um, growing up, uh, I'd have to. That's a great question. I have to go back and re-examine that. All right. So then, what would Christ be telling you to do? 
he will be telling you to go and preach the gospel, right? It will have nothing to do um, with your ethnicity today. It will have absolutely yeah. nothing to do with how you grew up, but that yeah. you preach salvation to all men. If so I go would, to speak to, here's the thing about the gospel. And we, says, we're, speaking, we're, speaking and then, we're speaking hypothetically now, right? At this point, at this point. All here right, we go. Cool. Yeah. If I come to not speak to a person who's mm -hmm. Chinese or Japanese and I preach them the gospel, what room is there for my ethnicity? They're right, because my ethnicity cannot help them receive salvation, nor can theirs help them receive salvation. Ethnicity is not an importance when it comes to the gospel. It's not do you the gospel consider yourself, plus do you, ethnicity. Do you consider yourself black? I consider myself a child of God. I don't, I don't, I'm not a color. Are you, okay, so are you African-American? No. I've never been to Africa. How can I be an African-American? So you you're see, just simply an American, I, never, right? I, I've never been to Africa. So, so do you have African, to be... So am I African by descent, way of your, America? Your, your descent. Your ancestors came from West Africa, correct? Listen, my ancestors came from what? The world. See, and that's the problem. Everybody wants to put all... Listen, the Bible tells us that all men came out of one flesh. When you start to want to add uh, islands and nationality, and all, it's not important. Wait, 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 wait. Did, came out of Adam and Eve. So when we go to Acts, when we go to Genesis chapter 10, um, when the nations are being divided, who's responsible for that? Man or God? Is or God. God. So God is the purpose, one that created but, God is the one that created nationalities, and we see through the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, where all these people went, where they settled, and they were called different groups of people, correct? And why would, why was that done? What was that showing? What was that leading up to? So what was that leading up to? That was leading yeah. up to now being that the text was written by somebody who we would call a Jew. They were trying to make a particular point that their deity was in charge of the entire world. Right. Or the known world at that time. But that had mm -hmm. nothing to do with the distinction. When we go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse eight, we see that uh, yod heh wav -Hey had chose a portion of people for himself, which were the children of Israel. But there was other entities that were over other groups of people. We see that also in Judges chapter 11. So okay. when we so try to get rid of the ethnic thing, what we're doing is we're creating a gray area and we're not properly putting things in perspective because, like, for example, when Daniel was in captivity and this man appeared to him that looked like what we see in Revelation chapter 1, the entity told him that he has to fight against the prince of Yavon, which is the Greeks. So obviously nationality does mean something, Especially when we go to Acts chapter 2, where Peter is speaking to the multitude, and they're telling you specifically where all these people are coming from, because there is something there that is being conveyed by the author about where all of these people are coming from. They still all had different nationalities, but what they agreed upon was the feast days, and it was coming there for a particular feast day, hence why I gave the opportunity for Peter to speak to them. So we can't okay, just say we're going to eradicate I'll ask the question. That's, yeah, that's, it's not that's, about eradicating that. really ethnicity. bad for you, Elder, if you don't even identify as an African-American or listen, black. Listen, that, you can listen. Listen, you can feel that bad for me as you want, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. What I need okay. to do is see scripture that says, promote this with the gospel. Remember, it's all about Bible with me. Where's that in the gospel where it says promote that? Where it says listen promote what? Ethnicity, where it's important. What does gotcha. it say in so, that? I'll give that to you. Ready? You got to go to Matthew chapter 10. So you're going to go to before. You keep saying before. I thought, I'm supposed to follow, I, okay. I thought I'm supposed to follow Christ. So if Christ is saying here something, here I don't. Here we go. So Let's see what he says. It's irrelevant. Let's go there. Gotcha. So that means it's, that means it's irrelevant if Christ. So because so, everybody keeps saying before as if the things that Christ taught and what he did is irrelevant now that he died and Paul's taken over. That I, I don't see it that and, way. And, I, and I, it's not that Paul has taken over. The thing is this. Mm -hmm. The things that were revealed to Paul were not known. It tells you that these things were a mystery. So now that they've been revealed through Paul. Uh, and so you it decide, supersedes what and, Jesus taught then. So I'll, I'll get back to what I was saying, which sure. was that these things that Christ taught Paul would never supersede Christ. But Christ is revealing to, to you to let you know what's important and what is not. It's not about somebody being a follower of Paul, because anybody who follows Paul's writings know that Paul got them directly from Christ, which means these are the things that are written by Christ, unless you don't agree with the word of God. That's period. So then after this, and after you go to uh, Matthew chapter 10, I would still like to see that scripture that says, add ethnicity or preach it in the gospel. I just okay. want to see it. 
Gotcha. So verbatim, what you're saying is not going to be there. So that is a straw man mm -hmm. argument. So we're no, not. No, it's not a straw man argument. It's an argument that you're making. No, I didn't. That the I didn't Bible say doesn't that. support. No, I didn't say that. What I was trying to express to you that ethnicity does play a role, and we're going to see that when we read Matthew chapter. Does 10. it play a role in the gospel and in yes. the body of Christ? Correct. It does. Okay. Let's According see. to what Jesus taught here. On, so he see. taught the gospel of the kingdom, right? So in Matthew chapter 10, it says, and when he had called his... Which disciples verse? Son, Matthew 10 and what? Because the people uh, want to know. Mm -hmm. okay. Verse 1. All right. Um, and they're telling me to go They tell me to go to Romans. I was trying to hold off until we have our formal discussion on that. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it says, sure. and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them mm -hmm. power over unclean spirits to cast mm -hmm. them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. Now, the names of those was blah, blah, blah. So when we jump down to verse 5, it says, these 12, Yeshua sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach to them, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely you're given. So here, ethnicity plays an important role because he is directing them to only go to the lost sheep of Israel. He has not died yet at this time. Right. There was no burial. There was no resurrection. There was no reappearance. There's no him going up into the heavens. He is simply telling them, I want you to preach the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of heaven. I want this is what I want you to preach to your people. Don't go by the way of the Gentiles or into the way by the Samaritans. I just want you to give this message to your people. So the nah, people okay, who received that good. message, that's good. Or they, you, you no, failed to do the something. Question, Hold on, hold on. So the people who received <laughs> that they will prove that received them. And they received this message that Yeshua was telling them to go preach to them. Were they saved at that point or no? But see, that's not what we just want. I'll get to that. No, 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 it is. No, address, is no, no, address here, here. Address sure. the question that I asked you before you asked me a question. Show Which where he's what? promoting teach ethnicity in here. Because and that I, is the subject matter that we're talking about. Can no, no, you show no, us the line or the verse that he is saying that this has to be an ethnic thing? So you gotta okay. stick to the you gotta stick to what's we what we talking about. I don't get I, lost in translation. No, no, so, but you you brought that point up. I never stated that. People can go back to the video and, and see that I didn't say that. What I'm trying to simply tell you that ethnicity does play a role in regards to what we're reading. And I'm giving okay. an example here because he did not he could have simply said, Go to everybody and bring this message. He didn't say that. He Hold on, here you go. Here wait, you, wait, 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 wait. He kept it specifically okay. to a specific demographic. And what I'm saying is when he sent them out in Matthew chapter 10 to go and bring this gospel of the kingdom to their own people, I'm asking you, at that point, were they saved? Because he didn't die yet. So Were they saved? So now you want me to address a question, and we're not finished with the first question. Because no, this, the, ain't, this the, not about salvation you right asked now. The this first is about question. I said, that, I said that, that, that line is not there. What you're telling me to find is not there. Because I didn't okay. say it. I'm okay. simply saying right. to you. That ethnicity does play a role, and here's an example in which ethnicity plays a role when he is commanding them to only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and not by the way of the Gentiles and not the city of the Samaritans. I'm saying the fact that he's telling them to only go to one demographic is obviously showcasing that ethnicity does play a role, at least here. This is okay, this so stick now, here, at now, least here. Okay, so that's your take on it. Now, I'm going to read mm -hmm. it, and we're going to see what it's talking about. We're going to see why it's saying what it's saying. Sure. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, right? These were the followers, right? It's not the nation. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? Please exegete that, Elder. All right. Why so the problem, it, mm -hmm. this is why it's being said. Israel had to be preached the gospel first. It's not an ethnicity thing. It's already, t it's already told to us in the Old wait, Testament wait. that he had what? to go to Israel Why do you have first. to go to them first? For what? Be <laughs> they were unbelievers. They listen. They were off doing, following all type of nonsense, and they weren't following the Messiah. He, and they had to be taught. They are sinners. They didn't have okay. faith. They were doing all type of things. So let's let's so, look at this. So, so when but, he but told see, them but see, Ryan, Ryan, this is it. You yeah. you got to read the whole read the whole thing. So let me. I didn't. You broke up. Let me read yeah. the whole thing and let me read the whole thing and exegete it. And then, sure. you know, rebuttal. Okay. All okay. right. So verse, uh, verse uh, five again. It says, these 12 mm -hmm. 
Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep. Not an ethnic thing, but they were what? Lost. Because they were what? In darkness. Wait, wait, wait. They were what? Not following God. Lost. But, but listen, saying... I'm, listen, I'm exegeting. <laughs> okay. I'm exegeting. I All got right. you. Okay. All right. So you're it saying this is not an ethnic thing, but it says the house of Israel. So the house of Israel is not an ethnic thing? What is the context pointing to? Because whether you want to say just because someone is mentioned don't mean that the context is talking about an ethnic thing. It's talking about a lost thing. It's talking about a what? Salvation thing. Not but it says the thing. lost sheep of the house of Israel, not the lost sheep so of the Gentiles. Not the lost here's, sheep of here's, the a, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. Every time you see the word Israel, does it have to do with ethnicity because Israel is mentioned? For no. the most part, yeah. This, listen, this is the yeah. thing. You, you dealt with exegesis earlier, right? Okay. And we also deal with contextual criticism. And then the okay. context of which this is talking about That's has what we're absolutely doing right nothing to do with ethnicity. It has Whoa. to do with salvation. Here so it is. Then, and I'll, but okay, first, go ahead, go ahead. I'll keep, let you finish. You keep jumping I'll let you in. Finish. All right. Go ahead, it go says, ahead. these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who is the kingdom of heaven? Who is at hand? The Messiah. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. They're going to preach. This ain't an ethnic thing. But who are they There's preaching to? Who's the receiving audience? So then here's the thing. Just okay. because you want to single out who they're preaching to, it's not what the writer is talking about. The writer is talking about them receiving what? The kingdom at hand, which is the salvation through the Messiah, because they are lost sheep. They know who they are. Ethnicity don't need to be taught to them. They're the lost sheep of Israel. They don't need so, to know nothing about ethnicity. They know who okay. they are. All right, got it. So, okay, cool, cool. All right, so let's, uh, let's transition from there. Because, uh, again, what I was trying to showcase, that ethnicity does play a role in certain contexts, right? Uh, another example, because we're talking about ethnicity, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yes. ethnicity okay. dealing with the gospel. Let's keep it where we where we at. It's ethnicity. Okay. So so so, the, so that gospel, the gospel. That gospel there, would they have been preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection at that time? What did they say they were preaching about? No, I'm so asking you. Exegete. Well, you asked no, me, asking buddy. You. So then we know what it's preaching at. The scripture tells us the kingdom at hand, Christ, the Messiah, is here. So who is that his death, burial, and resurrection? Was, who, I'm asking. Who was, listen. Don't try to switch topics. Here it is. I'm, I'm, I'm asking okay. you so questions so specifically. Here's it is. Here's, let's, okay, let's, go ahead. Here, let's 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 do mm -hmm. this. Let's not be coy, because I'm not being you coy either know you. If you either you know what you know. Here's the thing. They were told that the Messiah was coming. It was prophesied that he was coming, that he would ride in on a donkey and all of that. So right here, where he's saying that, tell them the kingdom is at hand. Who was they? Who who was they supposed to come? The king. Period. So, so I'm, I'm asking, so is it telling them at this point, Matthew chapter 10, does this have to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Is that part of the message he's sending them to go teach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? That is not part of the message. Okay. It's about the king, so that, being, at, the king being there. That's what it's about. Oh, okay. It's about, so, the, so, it's about the Messiah coming like was prophesied. So that he gospel that he sent them to go speak is not the true gospel then, because it doesn't incorporate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If that's what you're saying. Because no, I'm, I'm asking I, you, brother. I, no, no, well, see, this is the thing. Trying to get me to feed into nonsense is nonsense for me. Because, but how I, 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 never, listen, because I never said anything like that. To, so to try to put the question out there as if, oh, is that what I'm saying? If that's what you're saying, then you no, say no, no. it. But that's I'm, not what I'm saying, because I didn't I'm, say I'm, it. I'm asking you a question. It's like earlier, you told me to find something that I didn't say was there. I'm simply trying to show you that there's a distinction in regards to ethnicity when we look at the text. That's all I'm that's that's what we're talking about right now. And that goes back to Paul's apostleship and who he was delegated to go speak to. I'm just asking if we're looking at Matthew chapter 10 and it says, don't go by the way of the Gentiles, don't go by the city of Samaria, but only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you're saying, well, the reason why he's saying this is the gospel has to go to him first. I said, cool. 
I said the gospel that's being preached right there mm-hmm. did it have anything to do with his death, burial, and resurrection? And there's a reason why I'm 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 asking you this, Elder. I'm asking, does it have anything to do with his death, burial, and resurrection? Because now we're talking about ethnicity. I, I clearly answered that. Of course, this wouldn't have to do with his death, burial, and resurrection because he hasn't died yet. So, like I said, sometimes gotcha. when you ask a question like that, it's like, why would but you even prophetic, ask that? When, we, when we know what's going on? And that's the thing, like, you know, for me, dealing with these so-called Hebrew Israelites and, and things, to try to set trap questions is like, it's unpurposeful because it, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to see through that. And to ask me that question was like, are you serious? You, you see what I'm, I'm saying? Very, it's a question. I'm, I'm very it's serious. a question. It's a mm-hmm. question that wouldn't even need to be asked because we both know that the Messiah hadn't died yet. So, so the people who, yeah, so the people who okay. received this gospel message that the apostles, or at this time the disciples, had brought to them, did that contain salvation? Like, if they accepted that message that he sent them to go and receive, would they have received salvation? During this time period, that's what I'm asking. Of course, they would receive salvation. Here's the question: He's sending sure. out twelve, right? Mm-hmm. Those twelve are believers, right? Correct. How does the Bible say that you enter in through belief? How did Abraham mm-hmm. get in? Did, did was he preached the life, death, and birth? He so believed. it was it was through faith and belief, right? And and, obe- and obedience as well. Okay, faith, belief, obedience, all of that. Correct. So mm-hmm. these 12 that's standing here would believe on Christ, right? They would believe on the Messiah. So they didn't the believe Testament, everything, though. They didn't believe everything the, at this point. Whether, that's, that's not here nor there. The thing is this. Okay. Through belief, you receive salvation. That's how Abraham received it. That's how Old Testament saints believed it. Of course, they wouldn't have been preached the life, death, and burial of, of Jesus Christ. He hadn't died. They wouldn't have known, but they believed on the Messiah to come. Old Testament, they believe on the Messiah to come. The present Testament that we write here in Matthew, they believe on the Messiah that's there. In our dispensation, we believe on the Messiah, which is to return. Matthew 20, 29. Blessed is he who believes and has never seen. So it's all about okay. faith and belief. And obedience. And when you okay. ask those questions in that way, it's mm-hmm. like you're being disingenuous. Not and at it's all. Almost, it's, it's, and it's almost insulting to the point to say, what are you going to ask did, me about? Did, I mean, this, if this, you there's no need you, to that. This, okay, Elder, let me, right. let me explain something to you, right? You're, I don't know how old you are, but I know clearly that you're much older than me, right? Mm-hmm. I've learned as a teacher that there may be people that's going to ask you questions simply because mm-hmm. they're trying to find an answer. If you're an elder who is much older than me, I would look for one of the fruits of the spirit, which would be patience, self-control. And if a person much younger than you is trying to find his way and he's asking questions to inquire and you simply tell him, well, you're insulting me by asking me that question. This is something that we should know. That is not showcasing to me, Elder, that you are exemplifying any degree of patience to try and teach me something by walking me through what it is that I'm asking you. With that title of Elder, there's more responsibility and obligation on you than me. Mm -hmm. I don't have that title as Elder. You have that title that's elder. Well, I, what I find is this a lot of sure. times. God says this, that men will come with the cunning craftiness of words. Just because one man is very kind and another man is not so tolerant has absolutely nothing to do with how I preach or how I teach. What I'm I do is this. Uh-huh. Okay, so speak, teach, debate the Bible, all of those things. First of all, I haven't been rude to you at all. No, I didn't say you were. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I say that I feel like you're being disingenuous by trying to ask me a question, the thing about this, Ron, is I've seen some of your videos, just like you've seen some of mine. I've seen some of the things that you say and the things that you believe. Now, just because I've never told you that does not mean that I don't know and seen how you've acted, but I don't I don't have to bring all of that up. It's, it's just nonsense. So well, when I see that the man... It's not nonsense if you feel that I'm in error and you see something in my behavior that would be perceived as craftiness as an elder, I would love for you to bring it to my attention so I can repent from it, right? Because that would be the goal, to have men repent. And it's through repentance that you find salvation. So if you're saying that you've seen my works and you are assuming that I'm being crafty in my dialogues with other people or my teachings, 
I'm saying as an elder, you have the responsibility to bring it to my attention, whether it's online or offline, so that way it may be corrected. I'm assuming that's, that is what an elder is supposed to do. We go into the book of Timothy and Titus, it speaks on the role of what an elder is supposed to do. So that, that's what I'm trying to convey to you. That's all. Okay. So, as we see over here in Matthew chapter 10, okay. the, dealing with the, with the context of this, there's right. no, no, there's no showing that ethnicity had to be taught here, because that is the topic that we've been dealing with. Should you teach ethnicity? I'm Israel. I'm a Hebrew, along with the gospel. We have not okay. seen one line of scripture that shows that anybody who is teaching that is in error, and I, anybody in the context, anybody in the in the uh, audience, all these things, you know, unless you have a scripture to back you up that man can teach and think that he's correct until the cows come home. But for those who are Bible believers, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to prove all things, hold fast to that which is true and or good. There is no proof in the Bible that you should be adding any ethnicity with the gospel. That is the speculation of man, which turns into a doctrine of demons, period. There is, no, there is no one verse, and I know there isn't one. That's why I asked the question. So when it comes to it, either you receive that that's error or you don't receive that it's error. And we, you know what I'm saying, we can not agree or whatever the case may be. But unless you have biblical facts and when you say that you are a believer in the word of God, then once 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells you to prove all things and then I ask you the question and then you can't come up with one scripture, that confirms that you are to teach ethnicity with the gospel, you either receive it or you don't. After that, really, I've done my job. And anybody else that, you know, decides they don't agree or this or that, or they have their own biases, I challenge them the same way to say, hey, where's the scripture at? Because if it's not the word of God, then it's the doctrine of men. And if it's not the doctrine of men, then it becomes the doctrine of demons. But we know it's not the doctrine of God because it's not in the word of God. Gotcha. And and I'm not going to do it now. But if we went through and perused through the tenets of faith that you hold to, um, I could show you where there's reputations that that's considered a doctrine of man or a doctrine of demons. Right. Are you sure? Um, but that's I'm, I'm positive because there's thousands of worldviews out there that pertains to Christianity. And I study this stuff a lot. Like I, I've done this. When I was when I was a Christian, I was an apologist, right? I was a minister, I was a youth pastor, I preached all over the US and I studied a lot of apologetics from people who are in seminary, who teach seminary. So this is stuff that is not new to me that I'm very familiar with. Um, so I'm aware of what's out there. All I'm saying is if you laid out and said to me, by the spirit, this is why I follow A, B, and C because the Bible says so. What the Bible says, how it's interpreted and how it's applied are two different stages after you read what's there and after you prove text what's there. So that's what I'm saying. When you when you just just passing off that anything that I would believe would be a doctrine of demons, that is very um, trying to find a good word to use belittling for any kind of reasonable dialogue. Right. I'm not asserting myself above you. I'm not telling you that I'm better than you. I'll die and saying that I know more than you. I didn't say that if you don't accept what I'm saying, then that's it. I'm trying to reason with you. If we go to Isaiah chapter one, when the most high was speaking to the children of Israel, knowing that they had backslid and knowing that they had did the things that they did. He said, come, let us reason together. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to destroy all you because I hate all you. You didn't believe the, the doctrine that I gave you. He said, let's reason together, because that's the only way if you're trying to win a sinner back. Is to take time to reason with that individual. There may be things that they say, things that they do that you may not agree with, that you may not accept, that may be intolerant to you. But the only way that you can truly win somebody, they're seeing the fruit of the spirit in you. And if they're not seeing that, then what would draw them to you to accept whatever gospel that you're conveying to them? Over? Here, here, let me let me make sure. it really clear. Right. So we've all seen what you teach and what you believe. Right. Now, remember this, as we were having our little go back and forth about uh, the thing in the chat. The thing is this, I would never, after seeing your videos and seeing a bunch of people tell you what the truth was and you not receive the doctrine, for me, it's not, the Bible says at 1 Corinthians 14, if a man wants to be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 
It is not that I come to disrespect, but I quote the Bible and I quote it direct. Jesus when did Christ, I not quote the Bible, though? Did I not quote the Bible? On this I'm, not, I, I'm not talking about you personally. and I didn't say that you didn't quote the Bible. No what problem. I said is this. I know what you teach. It's no different than me going to a Jehovah Witness and I know what Jehovah Witnesses teach. The Bible also says, after the first and second admonition, a divisive man reject. So if you don't accept the doctrine, like I said, you, you called me. Right. You posted my name. I know what you teach. Once I've seen four or five people try to tell you something different and you didn't want to receive it. I'm not coming to you because the Bible commands me to go on. But you called me because you felt like I did something to your friend, which That's lied not on I me. Called you. That's not why I called you. You could just ask. Then why'd you why call me? You. Well, then why'd I you called call you me? Because I called you because it seemed like you was a reasonable individual. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me, and this is my perception, because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. After watching your videos and material, that you seem to have a very strong passion to win Christians over who are caught up in Hebrew Israelite doctrine and or forewarn them of the doctrine so they can avoid the pits of hell and receive the gospel as you teach it from the scriptures. And I said, if you have a grievance with the community, I think that it would work best if you're able to sit down and speak to somebody who's diplomatic and tactful who can convey these things to you so that you can reason with them to at least see where they're coming from instead of assuming the things that's being taught is a doctrine of a demon. I can so say you I just I can say what you're teaching is doctrines of demons. It's subjective. Okay. I can say that okay, another not, Christian, hold on, I have I have Christians, I have Christian associates who have seen your doctrine outside of you doing apologetic and they've said that you're in error. And I said, well, you know, that's your opinion of that. Let me speak to him to see where he's coming from to let him convey his truth because by peradventure, and I, you keep referring to Paul, Paul also talks about the patience and preaching the gospel to people peradventure, meaning that if you continue to persist with them, that that person then will receive and then they will believe. It's, it's, a, it's a process that you have to go to and deal with. I'm not saying you was rude, Elder. I didn't say that. It just mm -hmm. seems that you're being very belittling by assuming. Now, you say you know what I teach. So here's my question. What is my position on baptism? I have no idea. Then you don't know what I teach. No, I don't know everything that you teach. So that what, would be more correct. What do correct. you know about me that I teach? What, well, this is the thing. Here, this is where I'm at with this. Sure. Like I said, we looked at the scripture because I'm not going to jump to another uh, another topic now about what you teach or what you don't teach. My thing is this. I showed that the Bible did not say what you were saying, that ethnicity is important. That ethnicity that plays a role in the context of scripture. It does. That's what I was saying to you. Okay, so then then I ask the question, where does God say preach ethnicity? Matter of fact, I and gave I two scriptures that showed you that. He said preach ethnicity because it's not there, and I never made that argument. All I right. never said so that. Then, so then, when mm -hmm. you went on your whole thing about, well, we should teach them this, we should teach them that. It's a, matter of fact, when we went here to Matthew chapter 10, you said it was an ethnic thing. But when yes. we read it in, when we read it in context, we see there was no mention of ethnic, just a mention of going to some lost people. Who so House to of be Israel is not an ethnic group? Is, is the House of Israel an ethnic group? Let me ask you this. If I said, mm -hmm. I, can, I want to go over to Israel, does that okay. have anything to do with it being an ethnic group? No. It depends on the context. Are you talking about exactly. Israel? Exactly. It depends and this on the is context. Within context. And the in house this of context, Israel. has mm -hmm. nothing to do with ethnicity. So the you House of Israel word, is not an it, ethnic group? You don't see the word ethnos in there. Let's stick to what the scripture that where you took Whoa, us. Wait, was wait, that? hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, uh -huh. wait. Did you look up that word there for Gentile? What word is that there for Gentile? Should be goyim. Should goyim? Be. Goyim is a Hebrew word. That's not Koine Greek. So, so okay, so here's the thing. No, it's, it's I'm not, not Koine Greek. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to jump off into Another whole topic at this. Oh, that's not a, that's right. not a whole topic right. because part right. of exegesis so, is that you so, got to know what is said there in the original here, language here, and how it's conjugated. Okay, okay yeah. I get you. And unless you're gonna pull okay. it up on the scripture and show it to everybody, if if you want me to show it to you, yeah, but I I, I can okay. tell you for certain so, it's not nah. boyin. Uh -huh. So here here's the thing. Sure. Back to the topic. The topic okay. is this. It didn't show you to preach ethnicity, and that was I my never grievance. said. To, I never said to preach ethnicity. Okay, so if then, somebody let, let me explain to you my position. If somebody uh -huh. is an Israelite, uh -huh. right? How do you know if and they're, they're not a huh? That's a that's a whole nother discussion. I'll be uh, more than no. happy to have that with you. Uh, no. I can go onto your show and lay out for you my conclusion on that because if you've watched my work, I've laid that out already. 
But let me let me and, and I'm not even mentioning Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty eight. But let me let's 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 go to the point I was trying to make. What I'm saying is if somebody is an Israelite and I speak to them and I make them aware that that is their ethnicity and that there's a cultural mandate for them to do certain things, do you know what the benefit of that is? If I'm going to lead them to the Messiah, they can understand who the law master is, right? The school master is going to bring them to Christ. That's the purpose of knowing the law. Is that not correct? Yes or no? So Paul says this. Is it important for them to know the law? You can right. tell them about the law and lead them to Christ. I also use the law when it comes to unbelievers, but I don't have to tell them nothing about their ethnicity. Because they're not teach them up. How do you I know? Do. How do you know? How, how do, do I you know, know they're not? Yeah, how do you know whether they're Israelites? I, I don't know everybody that you talk to, but I'm assuming oh, it's oh, okay. other Gentiles. Do you speak oh, to do, Jews that you know? know? Now I'm asking you, do you speak to Jews that you know to convert them to the gospel? I speak to sinners. That's what the, that's what we commanded to do. Speak to sinners. So so all Jews, Jews are sinners. Wait, Jews are sinners. Did I'm you asking you a question. Are so all I'm men sinners? You, are all you, men sinners? Are all men sinners? Almost everybody does break an aspect of the law. Correct. Right. Um, so the question okay, I'm asking this, you, this, Elder. This, this is this is the thing. This is the thing. This is the so 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 you want to let's let's get scripture this, for that. This, this you want to go to this First John and have a dialogue this, on this, that. This this is the thing. All right. Sure. Like I said, for me, if you want to be in error, it's fine with me. But who said because I wanted to be in error? That's why I'm dialoguing. This, with. this, this, this is the thing. This is the thing. Mm -hmm. As you can see, you pulled it up. I wrote a book on this topic. I got it. Uh huh. Right. So I've dealt with enough so-called Hebrew Israelites to know that when you're just treading in a circle and that's what you want to do, then it's fine. And so I don't have to pull everything out because you don't believe it. I just proved to you that in Matthew 10, this wasn't talking about ethnicity. You say it is, but the context doesn't show that it is. Just because the, the name is mentioned, that. so then so you're dis saying that. We disagree again, there. And, and, and because you're saying that, here's the thing. Show yeah. where it's saying it. Show where it's saying teach ethnicity in that verse. But I never said it says teach ethnicity. I said ethnicity plays a role in the context of the scriptures. And I gave you an example of it, which is Matthew. So what 10. role did it play? It played in a role where the gospel that was being preached to them at that time was something distinct for those people. That's what that's the role it played. Hence so, why he sent so them the, out at that time so, while he was still alive. So then here's the thing. When we first got on here, we was dealing with. The original question and original topics about mm -hmm. are you supposed to go around teaching people this teaching people what that gospel about their ethnicity when it comes to the gospel well when it comes but, to showcasing them what their ethnicity is i don't see anything wrong with that so then what you're doing is if you're adding the bible to your showcase and if you just want to be a historian on ethnicity then you should do that and not add the bible to it because the bible commands you know where to do that if okay, you just want to the Bible, be, the, the Bible never be, erases any ethnic ties. All it does okay. is says to people if they agree on this one tenet, that that gives them a path to salvation. It doesn't say lose your identity once you come into Christ. They're not taught to lose their identity. The fact that you simply don't want to be identified as black, as an African American, just I guess it's, just an American. It's not, it's it's not about whether I, I wanted to be identified or not. It's what I'm showing you is this. Absolutely none of that matters. The only thing that matters is that I'm a believer in Christ. But now you don't live this, that way, Elder. Here's, here's the thing. You don't here's live that way, Elder. When Christ comes back, right? Okay. And we go on to the new heavens and the new earth, or we go on to the thousand-year millennium first. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be important? Absolutely not. It's Just what like going to be important. Not where, what, what your ethnicity is or yeah, it, it will be. It will be. What's the verse for that? Uh, if you go to the book of Revelation, 144,000 that are there to accompany Yeshua, they're all drawn out of specific tribes of the house of Israel. So that's showing that it's going to be important. Or is, that, showing, be or, or is that just a verse showing you when they get reconciled back to God? Because that's what that verse is showing you. So it's showing you you're saying, that the 144,000 okay. meet the Messiah mm -hmm. on the mount and that they what? That they believe. That's what it's showing you. And then verse so you're 9 saying shows that you... There was no, they had no prior belief in him before that incident. Is that what you're saying, Elder? Did you hear me say that? 
No, I'm asking you a question. You did imply that by what you just said. You said no, it showed that at that time they believed. I'm saying that they have a belief in him before that incident occurred. Absolutely. No, they did not have a belief in him before that point. That's why they go through the tribulation period. This is why the 144,000, when, when they go through the tribulation period, how do they wind up going towards the Messiah? Because the Antichrist comes against them when he goes into the temple. And then these people flee and run out and become believers and start to preach the gospel. And but that's that's the whole that's other talking about the 144,000. OK, that's which okay, still no not problem. which still not and has nothing to do with proving up ethnicity just because you mentioned who the 12 tribes are. So, like okay. I said, 12 if it's gates. so important, if it's so important, right? Mm -hmm. I'm at John chapter one. It says he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own. That's the nation of Israel. Uh -huh. And his own did not receive him, right? Okay. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children. So, so some of the ones that did believe him, were they Jews? When? His disciples. I'm going to stick to the text again. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood what does it say see we let the text speak what did the text just say so who were born not of blood so if it was not of blood then who was it not talking about there's going to be people that the jews there's going to be people that there's going to be people that cleave and, and are grafted into the house of israel like for example so do, so do you believe thing. in now, jesus christ right here's the thing hold on hold on before you go off yeah. to another thing i want to i want to clearly address what you said you said were those believers who were jews and then I answered you through the text. Notice I didn't have to add anything because the text tells us. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood. Okay. So that means it wasn't, that had nothing to do with the Jews at this point. Those who were not of blood. Okay. What you're reading in John of, is not the same book as Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 7 is the one where I re reference to the 144,000. So okay. you're referring right to something here, that's not related to Revelation chapter 7. I didn't try to relate it to it. What I'm, what I'm showing is this, that it, it is not a blood thing at all. He just showed you to become a child of God and to get in, it's not, it has nothing to do with blood. So as he says this over in John chapter 1, verse okay. uh, 13, he says that it's not of blood. In Titus 3 and 9, he says that what? Genealogy is useless, right? That's what no, he said. He, no, he, he, he uses a specific term for genealogy. You can get it real quick, and I'll break it down for you. And it says, but avoid, matter of fact, I'll start at verse 1. It says, sure. remind them to be subject to rulers uh, and authorities. What, what is this obey. again, Elder? I'm sorry. What scripture is this? This is Titus chapter 3, starting at verse right, 1. It says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, mm -hmm. to be ready for every good work, to speak mm -hmm. evil of no one, to be peaceful, mm -hmm. gentle, showing all humility to all men. And you're not and doing that right now, Elder, just so you know. Okay, well, here's the thing then. Hey, let's do this. Enjoy no your problem. night. All right. You're done? Listen, if, if I'm not being gentle to you and you feel all of a sudden bruised and battered because I'm reading the word of God, I haven't said anything rude to you. I haven't changed no, you, you any type of You said of I preached the doctrine of demons. You said I, I preached the doctrine you preached, of demons. I didn't say that. Go back and rewind the tape. What I said is that could be the doctrine of men, that could be the doctrine of demons, and that could be the doctrine of God. I never said what you preached. Do I preach the doctrine of God? I don't know. Do you? From what, what I see, no. If it's okay. an error, it's not the doctrine of God. Okay. Period. No That's problem. That's what the word says. No problem. Go ahead, Elder. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. It says this at verse three, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Right. So this is something that you receive, not of any work that you can do of yourself, which includes keeping the Mosaic law, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our savior. 
that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Same thing that is just talking about over in John 1, in believing in him and going through Christ. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Verse 10. It says, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Now, what law is he talking about? I'm just asking, what law is he talking about? All right. So um, going and looking at the word there for foolish, uh, that word comes from the word moros, where we get the word moron from, right? It means dumb, stupid, foolish. Um, when we're reading that, it has to do with uh, a person, figurative, that's mentally inert, dull in understanding, nonsensical, lacking a grip on reality, acting as though brainless. When I approach in regards to uh, ethnicity, in regards to a person being an Israelite, it does not fall under the qualifications of morals at all. It is not foolish. It is not dull. It is not stupid because it's leading to an expected end. So, again, looking at the definition of words and how they're being used and not to assume that, okay, well, when you talk about genealogy, automatically, he didn't say genealogy specifically. He added an adjective in order to define particularly what he's referencing in regards to genealogy and the law. Hence why the word there, foolish, is the adjective that's there for speaking about these other things that come up afterwards, right? So there's nothing dull, foolish about what it is that I convey to the people that look at my work in regards to ethnicity. The only thing that I was saying was that ethnicity does play a role within the context of the scriptures. And I think that is extremely clear anywhere. Now, when we talk about soteriology, as far as you know, salvation, maybe we have a different understanding of that. Maybe that could be something theologically that we can systematically you know, convey to one another so we understand what each other's role is in regards to salvation. But the point I think of this discussion had to go back with Paul, and I was simply saying that Paul admitted in Galatians chapter 2 from his own mouth that he was sent to the uncircumcised. That was what his role was there to do. He said Peter and, and, and James and John that they were delegated to the circumcised. Why? Because Paul said that his role as being an apostle was because he was already preaching to the Gentiles. He was then given the right hand of fellowship to continue on what he was doing because the Jews did not accept him. So in regards to what I teach, now, again, you, you keep referencing I speak to Hebrews lights all the time. I never said to you I speak to Christians all the time and you're just like them or the things that they do, you're doing like that. I'm treating you as an individual. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt because you're an elder, you're a teacher, and you're somebody who believes passionately that your job is to help people and prevent them from falling in error. You, you kept saying that I was in error, and that's fine. I'll accept that from you, no problem. But to, to cap things off, since it is kind of late, so I apologize if you were kept over the allotted time, even though we didn't really prescribe one. Um, but what I'll say in closing, and I'll let you close as well, is simply that if, we, if you are okay with us having future dialogues, is if you want, I can definitely call into your show. And we can continue our dialogue. I have no problem with that. It could be you and Robert Anderson and anybody else. I have no qualms with that. But only thing that I want to establish here is that uh -huh. there was no cursing on my part towards you, no denigration of your character. I didn't say anything as an ad hominem. I didn't talk about your family. I didn't call you names. I didn't say anything like that. I didn't say you're teaching a doctrine of the devil. I'm not saying that you're an error. I'm not saying you're teaching doctrines of men. I'm not saying your theology is incorrect. I'm not seeing any of these things because I want to clear a path so we can have a bridge and we can talk to one another respectfully and try to come together and reason. So I'm just trying to just set the pace for that so that way we can do that. If you have accepted that, Elder, and that is something that you see as reasonable from somebody like me who's your junior, then let uh -huh. me know and we can continue our dialogue. But if you simply just don't want to dialogue with me anymore, that's fine. Just let me know. It's no problem. Nope. Nope. Not a problem. You have been respectful. You have not said any... Uh you know, saying foul language or anything, and, and just to, you know, keep this clear, Ron, 
for me. This is never an attack against you. I've been taught one thing, attack doctrine. That's why when we, when we sit and we talk about these things, I'm always going to go to Scripture, and I'm always going to show what the Scripture says. And that's why when you see me read, I read, I read from the page, and then pull out the information from the page. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't do a lot of, you know what I'm saying, um, what do I want to say, uh, adding in of my opinion. Because, you know what I'm saying, the text is what it is. And when we look at contextual or lower criticism, we can see what the, what the, uh, what the Word of God says. But like you said, I have no problem with you calling in because it is always going to be about winning, you know what I'm saying, souls for the kingdom and giving correction for the Word of God. Now, for, to my own, uh, you know, to my own character, right, you know what I'm saying, not nothing towards you. And because you have been very respectful, and I have no problem with you. I have occurred a lot of so-called Hebrew Israelites, and they are very disrespectful. So the first thing, my first thing is this, whole armor of God, and I ain't playing no games. But like I said, you've been respectful. I don't have no problem with talking with you. But when it comes to, you know, your friend, I, I don't know if the guy's really your friend. I just know that. Yeah, he's an, to, he's an associate okay. of mine. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So then my thing was this with him. First of all, he went, he lied. He said a bunch of things that just weren't true. He did a whole bunch of promoting about, oh, we just want to promote our platform and this and that. For me, it's like this. Whether it's one person on the platform or whether it's a thousand people on the platform, I'm going to stay to the doctrine, period. That's what I'm going to do. I don't go out and promote that you have to come and see me do anything because the one person that I know is watching is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's watching. And as long as he's watching, I'm really not concerned with what men do. I'm just, hey, this is the doctrine of Christ. You take it or you leave it. That's just how I am. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not, you know what I'm saying, as soft talking as others. But I definitely, if you, if you, you know what I'm saying, respectful with me, I'm respectful for you. And I think in the Hebrew community, because when they came out and they started to attack so hard, when they came against me and I came against them so hard and they couldn't win the arguments, then, of course, they wanted to muddy up my name. But mm -hmm. the thing is this, don't throw a punch if you can't take one. Mm -hmm. So, like for me and you, you were respectful, I'm respectful. Hey, it's all about the doctrine. And we'd love to have you on the show or not on the show. We can talk privately. You know what I'm yeah. It don't matter because it's, it's not about, you know what I'm saying, a showmanship for me. And it's about sure. what, is, what does the gospel say? Gotcha. And so I have it. one last thing to ask you before we end off, Elder. Um, do you believe in that doctrine that, um, that Gentiles are to cleave unto Israelites in order for them to obtain a method or a form of salvation? Definitely not. Meaning that you don't agree with that, right? Uh, that's Old Testament. They, Israel was supposed to be a light. But as we mm -hmm. see in Matthew chapter 21, also in Isaiah chapter 5, God had already predicted that he would take the vineyard from Israel and he would give it to another nation, which was not a nation. And that nation is the church, which we see over in First Peter. So gotcha. no, we so, cleave to Christ. Correct. So, But there were still uh, Jews that were still the light, like the apostles and the ones that follow the apostles and Jesus Christ, they're still, Paul, they're still Jews, right? And they still yeah, have the light. Who did they have to cleave to? Who did who have to cleave to? The Jews, the apostles. Who did they have to cleave to? They had to come in Christ, just like we did. Correct. Did and they that's also, what it just said tonight. Yeah, but the apostles cleave to him. That's correct. So do you believe that when Christians, um, when they come to the gospel and they come to get to know God, through Jesus Christ, is that considered them cleaving to an Israelite or a Jew? No, that's them cleaving to God. First of all, Jesus Christ was God well before he came through Israel. So his title as God is way higher than him coming through the lineage of Israel. He was God but, but, before Israel was ever formed. But is he considered an Israelite in the flesh? He was considered an Israelite. I have no problem with that. But that still it still doesn't tell you anywhere in the doctrine that you are cleaving to an Israelite. It says you are cleaving to Christ, the Messiah, who is and God. Christ, and he was an Israelite, though, correct? Sure. Yeah, no problem with that. Yeah. So you so as as long as it's Jesus and you cleave unto him for salvation, you have no problem with cleaving unto an Israelite as long as the context is you cleaving unto Christ, correct? Nope. Okay, because so I'm not, therefore, listen, I'm not even going to play that word game because guess what? The Bible don't say nothing like that. The Bible it says, say the if, you believe, Christ? 
Mm-hmm. It says that if you believe on him, once again, when it mm-hmm. says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other name given amongst men by, by which you must be saved. Okay. It doesn't mention that he's an Israelite. It doesn't say that. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that uh, Christ was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. It doesn't say and you believe that he was an Israelite. It gives no promotion to be an Israelite, but that you believe on Christ. That's it. So once again, that is a man doctrine to say, well, you know what? By way, he was an Israelite. So, you know, you're, you're cleaving to an Israelite. No, I'm cleaving to God. Because if you, if, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. If I come and, and preach to you the gospel, the life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ, and I never mention that he was an Israelite, you still receive salvation. That's the way the Bible promotes it. And that's the way it should be promoted. But even with that, it says. But even with that, it doesn't change the fact that he was an Israelite. So then that being said, that is mm-hmm. something that a man would bring up, and that's something that God didn't see fit to have to bring up. Okay, but he chose him through the line of David, correct? The house of Judah. Sure he did. Not a problem with that either. I believe all scripture. But we still got to see where it says, and you know, by the way, he's an Israelite. See, that's the extra that the Bible does not attain that we have to understand. It doesn't. But the Bible, but the Bible does make reference to his ethnicity, though, correct? Sure. But what does the scripture say? Here it is. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. It says, mm-hmm. let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which became the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. So if we say by the name of Jesus, and he don't add the name of Israel, then it's by what? Oh, the Messiah alone, by no other name. So it's not the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and because he was an Israelite. The scriptures are clear. Gotcha. Okay, but that, that's that's just making an ultimate reference to Revelation. I mean, Romans chapter eleven. But we'll continue that on your show. So, can you tell the people when your show is, oh, and that way sure. I'll know uh, when to call in. Sure. We are on every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday of the week. Tuesday from seven to nine p.m. Thursday and Friday from six to eight. And that number that you can reach us is two four eight six zero seven zero six one one two four eight six zero seven zero six one one. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you for your time, Elder. I appreciate that. Look forward to speaking to you again in the future, okay? All right. Take it easy, Ron. All right. Shalom. Okay. So with that, family, um, I will be calling in at some time, um, I guess, as well. So um, this past Friday, I know they had a show, so I'll probably call in this upcoming Friday if I get a moment so we can finish our dialogue. Um, This was just impromptu freestyle. You know, um, I didn't have anything lined up for this discussion Um, for the next one. I can. Uh, But for this one, I didn't really have nothing lined up. What I wanted to do is just touch bases and kind of assess his angle, where he was coming from, to see what his grievances. And I think most of the grievances that he had was in regards to how he's approached by certain Israelites. Um, I did not want him to, you know, feel that every Israelite he encounters is going to be unreasonable. That's going to be disrespectful. That's going to call you out your name. That's going to say the most I going to kill you, destroy you. So I just wanted to remove those barriers so we can have a clear path of dialogue. Um, my expectation was that since he's an elder um, to exemplify a higher degree of patience, of self-control, of humility, of respect, um, being that he's an elder, um, he exemplified it for the most part. But at the same time, I think that the um, zealousness in him um, there were still things that he was, you know, showcasing or sharing that could seem to have been belittling. Right. Um, but I don't think he's aware of it. So I'm not charging it against him. But I just know that being that he's a clear cut straight in whatever that we can have this dialogue. I think the also assumption is that um, that I, you know, that a lot of Israelites cannot properly exegete the text, um, which um, some can't. But there are some of us that can Right. And um, that's also what I want to demonstrate with him uh, to stay right there in a particular verse 
in the context and go to the syntactical lexical analysis, the cultural analysis, historical analysis, contextual analysis, figurative literal analysis, and any other host of analysis, whether it's first reference analysis or whatever the case may be, and go systematically through the text and peruse through it to kind of understand that one of the positions that I teach is that ethnicity does play a particular role within the context of the text. It was written by a particular group of people to a particular audience. And as a byproduct of that, it opened up the door for Gentiles to come in and cleave. That is extremely clear by reading the text from front to back. Uh, I wanted to stay out of the certain scriptures in Romans 3, Romans 11, and so forth. I already have that on my list to go into later and have a discussion with with him um, and a lot of other things. But this was just a you know, preliminary discussion to kind of fill each other out. I see that he can be reasonable if he doesn't feel he's being attacked or somebody's trying to overwhelm him, that he has a degree of being reasonable. And I just wanted him to understand so that he didn't lose patience and try to cut me off or, or end the conversation. It's like, listen, I'm not here to attack you. It's just that there's a certain degree of expectation as if you're an elder, you have patience with somebody who's much younger than you and you walk them through. Right. You walk them through certain things that they may not understand to say that they're ignorant. That's one thing. But why? What is the root cause of the ignorance? And if you're not willing to address the root cause, then you can never win them over because the scripture says that one who wins a soul that he is wise. So how much wisdom do you have if you're trying to address a community? I'll give you an example. If I'm going to sit here and talk crazy about the Jehovah's Witness, but I have not won one person who's a Jehovah's Witness, then what is the purpose of me speaking about Jehovah's Witness? to condemn them and that's it, but I'm not showing no proof that I'm winning anybody over in the process, then what's the purpose of me even going about that assignment? So I'm not gonna sit here and I don't sit here and attack Christians. I deal with the egregore of Christendom and Christendom is promoted through Christianity. So therefore that thought form is in the mind of certain people who are Christians and they teach the Christendom. But then there's also Christians who are reasonable. There's also Christians who will say, okay, let's have a dialogue. Let me talk to you because through per adventure, that discussion, you can win somebody over to what it is they're trying to do. I'm not here to proselytize with anybody. I share the information I shared. And if other people get the information and they latch onto it, then so be it. If they don't get it, that's fine. But I'm not trying to go out here and convert people. I'm not out here trying to proselytize. I'm out here trying to push my doctrine of the ideology and tell people that this is what God teaches. And if you don't accept it, then you're going to hell. That's not my approach. I don't do that. When you get to a point where you're able to self-actualize your standing in the entire realm of things, the way you dialogue with people diplomatically and tactfully is extremely respectful. And I just feel really bad for a person that says to me that they're not black, they're not an African-American. I've never been to Africa, so how do I know? That is extremely scary. Like That is disheartening. Um, and I will continue to pray for that brother so that way he doesn't have that mentality because even though he says that, he lives in a world that is shaped by ethnicity and race, even amongst the ranks of those who call themselves Christians. So for you not to identify that is a problem. And what I will say, and I don't know if the brother is familiar with Dr. Eric Mason, but he should go and read Dr. Eric Mason's book on the work woke church and explaining the context of the black church in the overall scream of Christianity. I'd advise them to go and grab that book and read that book because at least if you don't want to accept it from me, somebody else on your side who's writing a book about that, you can identify that even though you say you're a Christian, that does not make you equal in this worldview. Now you may say, oh, that makes me equal in the eyes of God, but how you live your life day to day is impacted because of your ethnicity. There's nothing you can do to change that. You convert into Christianity, Go even perusing through the legal laws that was on the books that said even if a slave or a colored person, because you can even be free, converts over to Christianity by getting baptized, they're still not equal. They're still not equal to the other parishioners who have a different ethnic uh, group. Now, people say, oh, that's the past and that has nothing to do with today. No, that is still prevalent in a lot of Western Christianity. And that is the taboo and 800 pound gorilla that people don't want to address. They want to ignore it, act like it does. it's not relevant. Now that does not make you racist because I don't promote what is colloquially called racism, even though it is denotated value with something different. But what I'm simply saying is that you first have to acknowledge who you are in the grand scheme of things before you can go about anything else. And the people who have the edge or the advantage 
within that religious block in which you, you know, you associate with are telling you that it doesn't matter. It's because they are not suffering or they're not being traumatized by the same ethnic um, issues that you are. So it's easy for them to speak from that position and say, oh, you know, you ain't got to worry about ethnicity or race. We all one in Christ. It sounds good, but in reality, everybody who's a Christian does not think that way because they have been shaped and molded in Western society and there's a caste class system that we're still fighting against. So it's not to say that, oh, I'm better than anybody else. No, as a person who's awakening to the identity of who they are, they're given a greater responsibility to ensure that the character, the Shem, the Shem, the name of Yah is being exemplified through your character, through your actions. That is how you become a light, not rising yourself above everybody else and say everybody's beneath me. No, you have a greater responsibility to show them the judgments of Yah, to show them what Yah thinks about certain actions. When he thinks about certain ideas, when he thinks about certain things that are being done, there's injustice in this country that you cannot avoid by simply saying, well, I'm not black. That does not exempt you from being identified as black. Because when you go fill out applications and they say ethnic ethnicity, what you're going to say? You're just going to leave it blank? You're being perceived through the lens no matter what you identify with. And it's, and it's individuals that have that mentality. And I'm not saying anything negative about him, but people that have that mentality that start to kind of say, oh, well, I'm a Christian, so none of that matters. That is extremely dangerous. That is extremely dangerous. And I just pray that he never encounters, if he hasn't already, a racist interaction with somebody who also identifies as a Christian because maybe he needs that for the wake-up call. So I will continue to pray for that brother. I have no art or animosity towards him. I wish him well in his endeavors. I look forward to having future dialogues with him. Um, but, but like I said, you know, is, you know, even going through the text, there are a lot of things there that I, you know, it seemed to me that he didn't catch on, I guess, cause he didn't, wasn't prepared to talk to somebody who actually is, has a systematic methodology of exegeting the text and can look at it from various angles within context and be able to have that type of build a dialogue with, because he's not used to receiving that type from my community and it's okay. You know, he, no simple errors like, oh, it says goyim there. And I'm like, well, goyim is a Hebrew word. It will not say goyim there in the Greek. You have helene, you have ethnos, and you have uh, alophilos. You have other ways that that term is denoted. But when you do proper hermeneutics, you're able to derive that understanding. And it becomes second nature as you dialogue, right? So, again, no, no love loss. I hope that brother knows that even me identifying the way I identify, I'm willing to work with him. If he's involved in a community, if he has any programs that him, his church, or whatever is doing to help the community, to fix the community, I can rock with you with that. No problem. We can disagree, you know, theologically, that's fine, but I'm willing to still work with him if he's doing something to better the community. I have no problem with that. But it's when people have that type of mindset that then try to marginalize my community simply because of our what we identify with and don't want to work with us, provide us any resources, any manpower, any volunteers. When we're doing initiatives in the community, now it becomes troublesome for me because the people who suffer, the people who's outside the scope or that sphere of influence of these type of theological discussions, they're the ones that suffer because of our disunity. So with that, I say, family, thank you for watching. I'm going to go because it's extremely late. I didn't even know it was this late until I looked at it again. But I hope you all enjoy the dialogue. Again, the objective is to set the groundwork for people to see that you can have respectful dialogues with people who disagree with you, regardless of what the subject matter or anything is. I believe that a lot of people can be reasonable, but because most people are sensitive, it's very difficult for them to have thick skin and to have dialogues, even when there's an offense that's on the table. The scripture tells you that it is a love to cover another's offense. So even if he said things about me and my community previously, it did not hinder or impede me from having a dialogue. He said, oh, you came. Yes, I came to you because I want to create a bridge of dialogue so people can see both sides of the coin. And, won't, and one side won't have to be misrepresented because majority of your sessions don't have the other uh, uh, somebody who's diplomatic and tactful from the other community to actually convey the truths that has been realized within that community. So, again, I hope this at least was a lesson for us that we have to exemplify certain fruits 
So that way, when we're identified by that character, that's one less argument they can make against us. And that's something that we must handicap if we're going to actually have any kind of reasonable dialogue. And with that, family, thank you for watching. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed. Uh, stay tuned because, again, I will be calling in. I'll post it on Facebook so you'll know to, to listen in uh, when I dial in and have future dialogue with them. But anybody else that's out there that wants to have dialogue who has not been disrespected, respectful, slanderous, etc., I'm willing and open to do that. But if you have been slanderous or disrespectful in any way, I don't want to have any dialogue with you because I have not done that to you. So if you choose to do that to me and trying to seek for justification, you know, that, OK, he's doing the same thing and you're assuming it that then then you're looking for an excuse. You can have a dialogue without the disrespect, even if you disagree. But the moment you tread into the grounds of disrespect, it's going to be hard to trust you in the dialogue and hard to trust me and dialogue with you after that because it's going to be a personal thing. All right. So let's show that love towards our neighbor. Let's show respect for one another. And even if we disagree, family, if there's anything that we could do together to fix the community, let's rock with it. All right. With that, thank you all for watching. Peace and shalom.